The idea that we can replicate regenerative ranching across the world, there'd be nothing worse for the ecosystem of wildlife that we need to restore. For native ecosystems, we're talking wetlands, forests. You can't restore a full forest if you're doing regenerative ranching. 42% of current grasslands used as pastureland used to be forests or woody savannas. And like, I just wanna ask, are you advocating for a reduction in meat and dairy and animal source foods? Or you think that we can meet the current demand and the increasing demand with this model? The, the, the answer is, is neither. I'm saying that I want to use my land to its highest and best use in restarting the cycles of nature. And someone else could choose to make the same choice with plant regenerative agriculture. That's fine, I, I support that. But I want to be able to use, to follow my path, which is using my animals to restart the cycles of nature, which again is my form of rewilding. I think it's a beautiful form of rewilding. It's an act of incredible arrogance for you to decide this study's good, this one's not, this one suits me, this one doesn't. And then I think it's an act of incredible privilege for you to decide how people who've been on the land all their life should manage that land and what the people should eat that are buying the production from. So I'm, I'm blown away by that arrogance and privilege. I just want to have some some peer-reviewed scientific evidence of these anecdotal claims that are made. I don't think that's coming from a place of privilege. I don't think that's coming from a place of elitism. There's an abundance of research money going towards justifying animal sourced foods in a number of different ways. The claim that grazing is this, is a solution there, I think there's a lot of complexity missing from that statement. And I think that's used in a way to pull at the heartstrings to justify this this business that is destroying ecosystems across the world. I've compiled what I, what I think is likely the largest database on different reasons to shift to plant-based diets. This is not cherry picking data. This is a massive, massive library of the reasons why we should do that. Jason Roundtree, Will Harris, Nicholas Carter, and Jimmy Vidal, all outspoken and passionate about agriculture and the environment. The topic of how to feed upwards of 10 billion people with the least amount of deforestation and pollution is complex and layered. There's clearly big issues within the standard industrial farming system. And in this conversation, today's guests get into what they believe is the best way to farm and feed the world, both on a small and large scale. Will Harris is a fourth generation cattleman who tends the same land that his great grandfather settled in in 1866. Born and raised at White Oak Pastures, Will left home to attend the University of Georgia School of Agriculture, where he was trained in the industrial farming methods. After graduation, him and his father continued to raise cattle using pesticides, herbicides, hormones, and antibiotics and fed their herd a high carbohydrate diet of corn and soy. In the mid-1990s, Will became disenchanted with the excesses of these industrialized methods. In 1995, he returned to the farming method his great-grandfather had used 130 years before using regenerative farming methods. Will has since been recognized all over the world as a leader in environmental sustainability. He's the beef director of the American Grass-Fed Association and was selected in 2011 as Business Person of the Year for Georgia by the Small Business Administration. Jason Roundtree is a professor of animal science at Michigan State University, where he holds the Charles Stewart Mott Distinguished Professorship for Sustainable Agriculture. Roundtree's research focuses on identifying the metrics and management that reflect ecological improvement in grazing land and other agricultural systems. Roundtree has given presentations throughout the world and has helped in the funding to conduct food system research. Jason is also the co-director of the Center for Regenerative Agriculture at Michigan State University. His work in beef sustainability was featured in the movie Sacred Cow, and he too has been highlighted in the Washington Post, New York Times, Forbes, and many other popular media publications. Nicholas Carter is an ecologist and co-founder of plantbaseddata.org, a library of peer-reviewed articles and summaries on the environmental, health, economic, and zoonotic disease evidence to shift to plant-based diets. He's been a panelist for the Center of Biological Diversity and a speaker at the launch of the documentary Meet the Future, along with the Jane Goodall Institute. His thesis focused on the global estimates of greenhouse gas emissions attributed to animal agriculture and has since written reports and articles on biodiversity loss and food systems. Transitioning to plant-based farming systems has also been a focus where he's written about regenerative plant farming practices with a well-fed world. He also has acted as a scientific reviewer for the best-selling book The Proof is in the Plants by Simon Hill. Jimmy Vidal is a farmer, activist, consultant, and researcher. He has been a consultant, researcher, and volunteer 
volunteer with the film's Cowspiracy and What the Health and the Animal Protection Party in Canada. He lives on a small scale veganic farm in Quebec and has been growing his own food and homesteading for over 25 years and became a professional full time organic farmer in 2005. He worked and consulted on 11 organic and permaculture farms throughout Hawaii, Mexico, Central America, South America, and Quebec. He's the co founder of the North American Veganic Certification Standard, Certified Veganic, whose mission is to certify farmers throughout North America in 100% plant based agriculture principles and practices and create a community that works to end animal agriculture forever. In this episode, they discuss the differences between regenerative ranching versus regenerative plant agriculture, analyzing them from the lenses of what it improves on the environmental metrics and also if it is scalable. We see where there is common ground and where there are polarized differences. Not sure the needle was moved on either side, but I appreciate everyone's willingness and passion to come together and discuss such an important topic of our time so us listeners can hear both sides of the debate. It definitely gets a little heated, but understandably so because of the life's work that each of these guests has put their heart and soul into. I found the conversation very riveting. I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. Just quickly, I've got a tip for you to up your cleaning routine game. You'll save money and waste while using safe, sustainable, and clean ingredients. It's Branch Basics. They have non-toxic cleaning products that I love using in my home that are both effective and hardworking. These products are both plant and mineral-based and biodegradable, and I can safely use them around my kids, which is super important to me. And did you guys know that so much of the cleaning products on the market are largely filled with water? So we waste so much extra plastic when we could just use Branch Basics that supplies a bottle of concentrate. One bottle of concentrate makes three all-purpose cleaners, three bathroom cleaners, three streak-free cleaners, three foaming hand washes, and 64 loads of laundry because you dilute the concentrate with water in their reusable bottles. The concentrate is used in different dilutions to create all of the cleaning solutions. Then just refill the bottles when you're out. It's simple and environmentally friendly. So it is time to replace your toxic cleaning products because Branch Basics sets you up for success with their starter kit. It comes with the concentrate and the oxygen boost, which pairs with the concentrate for an all-natural way to tackle laundry, stains, and grout. And then it also comes with the reusable bottles, which comes in both plastic and glass options. The all-purpose bottle, the bathroom bottle, the streak-free bottle, the foaming hand wash bottle, and the laundry bottle. So use my code ELLEN15 for 15% off all Branch Basics starter kits. You'll be so happy with the result and making the switch to non-toxic and sustainable cleaning products. We're also brought to you by SafeSleeve. I love my SafeSleeve cell phone case, which protects from 5G EMF radiation. It comes in different colors to suit your style and has slots for your bank cards and cash, which is so convenient for me. Our electronic devices play a huge role in our lives, but all of our personal electronic devices, our laptops, cell phones, and tablets emit radiation. And electronic radiation is linked to adverse health effects. Even the manufacturers know this because they add warnings in the fine print. SafeSleeve offers anti-radiation products designed to give you the peace of mind of knowing you and your devices are protected while making them even easier to use. All of their anti-radiation products incorporate lab-tested shielding technology that can block over 99% of RF and 92% of ELF radiation. There are very few anti-radiation brands that offer lab-tested protection, and theirs is publicly available on their website, and maybe only one to two others that block ELF. ELF is much harder to block, but equally as important. And all of their cell phone cases provide military-grade drop protection, which is also tested by a third-party evaluator. So if you've been looking to get a case like this but have been hesitating, now is the time to get it because I have a discount code for you. Just click my link below in the show notes and enter the code ELLEN10 for 10% off your order. All right, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Today, we're going to discuss how to feed upwards of 10 billion people with the least amount of deforestation, pollution, et cetera, and also get into eco-friendly ways of farming, regenerative ranching uh, versus regenerative plant agriculture, analyzing them from the lenses of what it improves on the environmental metrics, and also if it's scalable, i.e., can this be put all around the world? So to get started, can you please make some opening statements, what you believe is the best type of agriculture to feed the world without destroying the planet? I'm going to have Jason, you go first, and then Will, and then Nicholas and Jimmy. Hello. Uh, thank you for the question. And I think you pose a great, a great question, Ellen, in terms of how do we look at the global complexity of, of feeding a population? And um, I think the way that, that I've focused my career the last 20 years in the space is that I start locally and work from the ground up. Versus often we have these big, large debates from 10 or 20,000 feet looking down. And every environment, every area in the world has complexity. 
um, their strengths and weaknesses to the ecosystems that we all work and function in. There's important uh, social dynamics that enter into it as well. There's uh, communities that have, have evolved on, on a, a highly vegetable-based diet. There's communities that have evolved on a, on a, in a pastoral hunter-gatherer setting. And so I, I think the way that, that, that I, I've seen things work is, you know, starting at that local place and, and understanding that, that really we feed ourselves from the land and, and understanding in that context, how can we do it in a way that's most ecologically and socially beneficial? And, and so most of the areas I've worked in throughout the world have been in a combination of plants and animals working in an ecological way uh, that not only can provide helpful food, but likewise provide a ecological resilience to a system. And that's the, the lens I've taken. Great. Well, how about you? <clears throat> The White Oak Pastures is my farm in Bluffton, Georgia. I'm the fourth generation of my family to manage the farm. My two daughters and the spouses are managing it today. They're the fifth generation, and I have five grandchildren who are the sixth generation growing up on the farm now. In my lifetime, I've seen the farm, or it, under our ownership, the farm has gone full circle from a uh, system that was very focused on the land, the animals, and the community, and it was highly resilient to being part of the industrialized, centralized, commoditized production system, which was very, very hard on the land and the animals and the community, and was not resilient. And over the last 25 years, moved back to a model that most represents the, the earlier model here. I have seen with my own eyes my, uh, the, the transition of how damaging the industrial commodity system can be and how uh, healing this production model is. So I look forward to talk to you more about that. Perfect. Thank you. Nicholas, how about you? So I, I first want to thank uh, everyone for uh, this conversation and for having me on. Uh, I think there is a lot of complexity to this topic and a lot of nuance. I also think that there is some big picture realities that uh, are important to understand as we're looking at the local system as well. So the WWF, Brent Loken and others have been quoted saying that the global food production is the single largest human pressure on earth, threatening local ecosystems, driving a, a, a six mass extinction, impacting the stability of the entire earth system. Now, this is the food system as a whole. Obviously, a lot to that. But we have turned a lot of the earth into farms, 50% of all habitable land. And this isn't done evenly. Over 75% of all agricultural land is for animal agriculture that returns back about 18% of global calories or about 37% of protein. And if you're looking at beef specifically, Obviously, a lot of spectrum to it, and we can talk about that today. But 60% of all agricultural land is used for beef cattle. And that only accounts back for about 2% of calories or 5% of global protein. So what has this kind of resulted in? This has resulted in mass wildlife collapse over time. There's other areas, of course, that have called, caused biodiversity issues. But right now, wild mammals make up only 4% of global biomass. And, you know, if you look at like humans and domesticated animals as a whole, it's 30 times um, as much as wild mammals. So this is a significant crisis and there is solutions here and there is kind of some complexity in dealing with this. But I think it's important to acknowledge some of these realities. Okay. Thank you, Nicholas. Jimmy, how about you? Well, first of all, yes, Ellen, thank you so much for hosting this debate and Will and Jason and Nicholas. Uh, thank you all. This is, this is going to be a lot of fun today. Uh, so I've been fortunate and blessed to realize that it was really, really important to grow my own food. And I started that 25 years ago. 18 years ago, I became a professional farmer, and that was in northern Arizona, uh, where the land that we had purchased had been fenced off for 10 years, but was completely, still completely overgrazed. It was a 640 hectare uh, section of land or 640 acre 
section of land that uh, was completely denuded of all native flora. And it was, and so, and it is interesting talking about these complexities because in Arizona, the, the cow manure would not blend into the soil. It would just sit and dry as a, as a dry patty. And we had, my first wife and I, we had this brilliant idea that we would pick up all the patties and manure, reconstitute it, and then use it uh, to plant in. And that's, and that's what we did. We thought it would make sense. It didn't work all that well, but we continue on. So uh, I became a professional farmer 18 years ago in Arizona. I became an organic farmer. Uh, after that farm of five years, I was lucky to be able to travel around uh, Hawaii, Mexico, Belize, Costa Rica, Panama, Ecuador, Colombia, and into Quebec and work and volunteer and consult on uh, small scale, uh, organic, even conventional, and some veganic permaculture farms. And this is what I noticed from around the world, that the best models were the smallest models. And this was actually proven also in a UN report that said 80% of all farms worldwide are family farms, five hectares and less. So the world model, the world scale model is very, very small. It's only in the United States and Canada where we have these massive farms. Canada actually has the largest farm uh, per, largest acreage of farm per farm in the world with US number two. And it's the only reason that we look at these models as being bigger is better, but it's not. It's more wasteful. It's worse for the environment. It's worse ecologically. Thankfully, in 2014, I, I made the transition over to veganic growing, veganic farming. It's still very small scale. We're only a half an acre farm. Five acres is completely left to rewild. And what I've learned is that by using just plants to grow plants, we can increase soil organic matter, we can increase soil organic carbon, and we can increase the amount of carbon sequestration we have. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. All right. So now I want to get to uh, where I think we find common ground and you guys find alignment. And I'm going to make a few statements. And with each statement, please let me know if you guys agree. So that helps us know moving forward, hey, at least we align and you guys align on this partic these particular topics. So the first one is, Factory farming in our current food system is flawed. Do you guys agree with that one? Yes. Everyone agree? You can make, you can say it out loud. Yeah. yeah. What about you? I think all agriculture has flaws. Right. Okay, cool. All right. The next one is we are in a climate and biodiversity crisis. Yes. Do you agree? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. and the next one is food prices and food insecurity is increasing. Yes. yes. You agree? I think food, food prices, um, I think it's a variable question based on where we are globally and as well as with food security, but I don't think that's a blanket statement we can make. Oh, okay. Okay. Do you want to expand a little bit on that? No, I, I think if you look at the, for instance, in the United States, as an example, I think we have a very, a very um, solid food supply that is, that is definitely, um, inexpensive and so i think that there's always pockets and food deserts and challenges anywhere you go but i i, I think that's a, a pretty tough one just to make on a on a big basis that way i think it, it's a very nuanced um answer i agree i agree with that too yeah, yeah that's i good. think that's a that's a good kind of nuanced yeah. response to that okay perfect all right and then lastly different types of conservation agriculture um, that I think you all both are in support of, which is no-till, composting, cover crops, and reducing fertilizers. Is that true? Yes. I, I think we're all for soil health principles. Okay, great. All right. Is there any more that you guys think that I didn't cover here on what you guys might agree with today, or do you feel like that covers it pretty well? I, I feel like we all probably understand that ecological approaches to to farming are, are very important. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now and let's get into the debate. For those who are listening and watching this debate, it's gonna be mostly between Nicholas and Jason and then Will Harris, the rancher, and Jimmy, the veganic farmer, are gonna chime in here and there as it suits. So for the first question, this is posed to both of you, but I'm gonna have J uh, Nicholas, you go first. 
what is the big picture situation with food and the environment based on the scientific literature today? I think it, that's a very complex question. I think we can answer it many ways throughout this um, conversation. But I think uh, ultimately, there's a number of issues with our food system. Uh, it uses a lot of land. It's not necessarily the most efficient. And we really need to make some decisions very soon because uh, the Western diet, the diet, you know, typically in, in richer countries is being exported to growing populations, poor regions as they become medium income, as they become high income. And that in turn is going to come with a lot of pressures on earth, pressures on planetary boundaries, pressures on land, biodiversity, deforestation. And when we're looking at a, a number of these factors, even if it's soil, uh, natural, untouched, or even rewilded areas provide a number of the benefits that we want. So we need to look at this situation. Okay, how do we produce food ecologically without using an extreme amount of land? How do we produce back a good amount of nutrients and proteins and, and calories in ways that can also provide um, economic and, and livelihoods to, to people working at this? So I think ultimately I would sum it up as this is very important right now because we have a choice to make. If we shift to plant-based diets, uh, in rich countries especially, this is the focus. Uh, we could free up about 3 billion hectares of land. And with that land, we could restore a lot of biodiversity. And there's been studies that shows we could draw down the equivalent of 9 to 16 years of current fossil fuel emissions. That's from a study in, in Nature from, uh, from Matthew Hayek and others. But if nothing is done, and the global adoption of this Western diet, you know, G20 food consumption patterns by 2050, we would exceed planetary boundaries in a number of ways. Greenhouse gases, it shows we'd increase it by 263%. And for land, that, this is just a typical food system right now. If that's exported, we would require up to seven Earths. And again, this is a study that is from a number of quality researchers, uh, Brent Loken, Willett, Springman, Jonathan Foley. And this does not consider regenerative ranching, which we're going to get into, right? That would use far, far more land than the typical food system. So I think this kind of sets the stage, I think, in, in my analysis of the research of the decisions we need to make. All right, Jason, you can reply to him. Sure, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think, again, first of all, um, is, is we look at, at management of land, and I've had the opportunity to work globally uh, in food production systems. And I've, I've worked with um, the Maasai. I've, I've worked with you know, all, all sorts of different cultures and, um, you know, having these topical debates on, on how we treat land is, is just that. And I think the fact is, is that every culture is different, how we do things are different. Um, and so when it, when it comes to land and, and how we work in the future is that there's people that are in the ecology of that land and not above it or not separate from it. And so when we talk about these concepts of rewilding, there's always people in the land, on the land, and of the land. Uh, that's something that's come from, from indigenous cultures. It's, it's who we are today. And therefore, I, I think the more plausible way, perhaps, of, of moving forward is focusing on how we manage the land. And, and how we look at embracing biodiversity as a component of regenerative agriculture. And I, I think simultaneously, regardless if we look at the output of a protein, whether it be plant-based or animal-based, that the most important thing we can do is consider how we manage those systems. Because no matter how you, how you work it, you're always going to have unintended consequences. And it's often difficult to assess what those unintended consequences look like. And I think the fact is that if we take the science and respect, Nick, the guys that you talked about, 
that, you know, these are often these large global assessments. But at the end of the day, it's farmers and ranchers and people in local communities that feed themselves and that feed that, that feed their communities and elsewhere. And so um, I, I have a heart for biodiversity. I have a heart for 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 wildlife. I, I have a heart for all those things. Um, it's just the lens that I've come through is very different. And it's it's one that that really is trying to work with how we manage to get the best outcomes we can based on on who owns the land, who's on the land and, and how it's managed. And so um, maybe just a different lens that I look at it through. You can go ahead and reply, Nicholas, if you would like to. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of that as well. I think um, these are complex systems. Decisions should not be made without analysis of the socioeconomic challenges that come with all this. Um, you know, when it comes to rewilding, people should be benefited significantly for rewilding. Um, you know, and that's kind of happening in some areas across the world. There is carbon credit systems that are starting to look at the science-based ways to draw down carbon. There should be more in terms of enhancing native biodiversity, not just a little bit of biodiversity, but significant amounts of land for wild animals to travel and uh, go from different ecosystems where they were before, including carn carnivores, including native ruminants where they should be. So I think this is all something that is complex, but there needs to be incentives for people that own this land to, to do this. Otherwise, I totally get it. This is not necessarily going to happen. Yeah, go so, ahead, uh, I think that, that Nicholas and I are in agreement in our feelings about rewilding. You know, I, I really believe that the industrial agricultural model that I used to be part of uh, is, is part of the, the destruction of uh, uh, extinct, ex species were driven into extinction. Uh, uh, Non-native invasives have been brought in. I'm, I, I, I really want to see my farm rewilded, and I think I have rewilded it. Uh, I think that what what Nicholas and I are part on is because I am experienced in this, I know if I just fenced my farm off and said, I'm going to let it evolve and go back to the pre-Columbian ecosystem that it was, it wouldn't happen. The pre-Columbian ecosystem had a lot of elk and woods bison on this land. Uh, and it didn't have invasive species like privet hedge and kudzu on this land. If, if I left, if I fixed this farm off and left it for a century or two or three, it would not look like the pre-Columbian. We, we have changed. We have done too much to change the environment. Uh, I, my rewilding, and it's very important to me. My rewilding is st restarting the cycles of nature. Restarting the mineral cycle, microbial cycle, carbon cycle, water cycle, energy cycle. Restart these things. You know, I, I actively am, am involved in this biomimicry, this emulation of nature. And it is a very imperfect emulation of nature. I would not claim otherwise. But it is probably a lot more similar to the pre-Columbian ecosystem than it would be if I just fenced it off with no large ruminants and, and many, many species that should that used to be here, should have been here, were here during the first evolution, and not here anymore, and species that weren't supposed to be here are now here. And you know, one of the ancient Greeks said, for every pestilence that nature sends, she sends the cure. And we have brought pestilences over, I can name you a lot of them, and we didn't bring the cure. We didn't bring the natural control system. And my, my form of rewilding, respectfully, I think is a lot more uh, efficacious and beneficial than many of the, many of the other uh, rewilding uh, systems I've seen advocate. Thank you.
All right, guys, I have to tell you about the apothecary Anima Mundi Herbals, which carries organic, wildcrafted, and ethically grown botanicals. Every vibrant and medicinally potent remedy is packaged in eco-friendly packaging of recyclable glass or biodegradable bags. Once you shop their site, you'll see what I mean. There are so many incredible goodies to get, but if you get just one thing, you've got to get their collagen beauty kit, which is full of plant magic to help support healthy hair, skin, nails, and bones. This kit includes a Dirty Rose Chai Collagen, which contains herbs known for their collagen protecting and boosting effects. It also comes with their Super Fruit Collagen, their signature formula composed of collagen boosting plants enhanced with the beautifying powers of super fruits. You also get an original collagen booster powder, a plant-based blend that's the ultimate beauty boost with adaptogens, ancient herbs, and flowers to support radiant hair, glowing skin, and healthy nails. And lastly, it comes with a collagen face oil and rose quartz gua sa, the perfect addition which feels divine on my skin. It would be an amazing gift to give a loved one, but if not for someone special in your life, at least get it for yourself. And Anima Moody Herbals uses fair trade practices beyond organic farming, education, and small farmers to create remedies that benefit people from all walks of life. So use my code ELLEN20 for 20% off. Just click the link in my show notes to get this deal. I really absolutely agree. And if you look at pre-Columbian times, pre-colonial times of the way, say, bison roamed, you know, they, they, they ran all the way from the prairies in, in the summertime, all the way down south to Texas and east to west. Now, I don't know how far east and west. I don't think they came all the way to as far as the deserts in Arizona. For sure, they went all the way to Georgia. Um, I'm not so sure. I I don't know if they went all the way to the coast, but you're talking about a large swath of land. So I absolutely agree with that. In that realm of the United States and Canada, where those bison were, theoretically, you could regraze that entire area from north to south with cows if they were to follow the exact same pattern, where basically they would go from north to south 2,000 miles or so every single year and back. But we don't do that with our grazing systems. But that is a very interesting point, that it could be done that way. The problem that I, I, under, I foresee with raising animals and raising cows in this way is that they're not living their entire lives. They're only living 20 months, 30 months. Whereas wood bison at the time, I think they could live up to almost 30 years old. Plus, there were predators involved in the circulation of those buffalo and First Nations people also that were taking what they needed to survive. But then take it a little bit further, and this is all, again, comes to the complexities of region. In Arizona, where I was, there probably weren't any wood bison, but there were other, there were other animals. There, were, there are mule deer, there are pronghorn antelope, there are others. And here in Quebec, there absolutely were no wood bison. So how we rewild here is completely different than what would say would happen in Georgia or where those buffalo would go. And this is exactly the type of complexities we can look at. And I think when we look at the global perspective, we still I still come back down to the fact that I believe we can do this by just incorporating cover crops and plants versus raising those animals and their subsequent harvesting or slaughtering of those animals. Yeah, I think, you know, Jimmy, I agree with a lot. And I I think that the way I've looked at it is, you know, I I think there are are systems I've seen globally that, you know, are where we are in history and in, in the process of our food system. And that, you know, managers work very diligently to mimic as much as they can natural processes. Um, there are many others that don't that I think absolutely have managed in a way with respect to grazing livestock that have degraded the land. I've seen it globally. I've seen massive complexities that interface uh, the mismanagement of grazing livestock and migrating wildebeest as an example or others, right? And and so, you know, I, I don't disagree, I think, with the fact that in a perfect world, if we could do something a certain way, we could look at it this way. You know, I I think maybe in my lens, I just, you know, I I feel like the the pragmatic approach now is to really work to try to mimic these natural processes where people are in their, in their given management system. 
right? In, in, in that way. And, um, and that's, you know, something I've watched Will do where, you know, he's got all these multiple species of livestock and birds and other things where it's as, is, you know, unique of a mimicked type of savanna as you might see. Um, and, and so I, I think that we probably agree, you know, with a lot of those things. The other thing, you know, Nick, I was curious what your thoughts are, is that like the areas when you look in Australia or in Africa or down in Texas and other areas, California, another example, is that like when we, when we relieve grazing pressure in some of these systems, the first thing that typically happens is we have all this bro woody brush encroachment. And I just remember working with the Maasai on the Mara and, and listening to a, a friend there that was a guide saying, you know, talking about his, his, you know, elders saying, you know, it used to be so much more open, right? When you had the megafauna that was, that was opening it up. And now, you know, with, with a, they, a, a lack of, of animal pressure in those systems, the first thing that happens is all this brush encroaches. And that lends to fire and things. And I'm just curious, like in your mind, if you were to transition to this rewilding, like what does that look like? Because we see the problems in California. I've seen them in Australia, Africa, and other areas. Yeah, no, thanks. That, that's a good question. And um, I think it's complex. But I think in areas that had these native animals before helping the ecosystem, we should be looking to return them. Obviously, easier said than done. Not always a perfect scenario where that's possible. But in looking at the meta-analyses that look at what happens when you remove grazing pressure, it's pretty damn good in terms of what it does for increasing not only plant diversity, but animal diversity. This was a recent study of the University of Alberta that looked at 109 different studies. And it was in many different countries, many different regions. And we're not talking like short-term like a couple of years, what happens? We're talking like after an amount of time, um, you know, 10 plus years of areas rewilded, areas protected to have as best as possible the native ecosystem that was there before, you're going to have a much better ecosystem with biodiversity, more carbon drawdown. And um, yeah, I think that's what we should be striving for. And you know, in terms of getting there, I get it. There's some difficulties in, in getting there. But um, I mean, in most cases, cattle are invasive. Cattle are not, they're not native to these areas where they're grazing. So yes, you can attempt to, to mimic it in some situations. And certainly there's a major spectrum in terms of, of, of grazing, which we can, we can, of course, talk about. But I don't see how we can restore some of the key stone species like carnivores into ecosystems that would be pasture land. I don't, I don't see how that can happen. So when in a rewilding situation, you of course can do that. And we need to do that. We need to protect land. So like, I'll just end it there on the last point there, like the biodiversity summit that just happened in Montreal in December of 2022, they're looking at protecting 30% of land by 2030 and 30% of ocean. Uh, it really should be more than that, but like, we're not even close to that now. Uh, and we need to for many reasons. So we should be looking at rewilding land. And the most logical area to get this from is those massive, massive areas of lands that are overgrazed. Nicholas, your, your statement was you don't see how that can be done. And I know you can't. But if you'll come see me, I'll show you. I'll show you. I'll show you land that has not been grazed for decades yeah, I've acquired land in the last 10 years that I've never seen ruminants on it, other than deer. I've never seen cattle, sheep, goats on it. And it's a jungle. It's a jungle of non-native invasives. That is so important. Non-native invasives. They're here now. And, and you know, the Pandora, out of the box. So, uh, you know, and we, we can't reintroduce woods bison. We've driven them into extinction. I, I admittedly, cattle are not native to North America. Admittedly, but neither are these invasives that we're battling. My land that I have been grazing looks a heck of a lot more like I believe pre-Columbian coastal plain looked 
and land that has just been left ungrazed, uh, no animal impact other than what's natural for, uh, I'm, I'm 68 years old and for at least my lifetime, probably long. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, a lot of that is true. A lot of that I agree with, Will. Uh, how, how do we um, scale this? How do we, like, in, in terms of feeding the world, I mean, we can get into this, but um, yeah, the scalability of this system. This is a very important topic. And um, yeah, what's, what's your thoughts? What's your thoughts on the scalability of your system? Okay, so scaling it and, and, and uh, feeding the world is a comment because that's, that's, that's the topic you brought up. <clears throat> and I want to admit to you that my system here is not super scalable. It is not. It may be as big as it needs to be. Quite a passage may be as big as it needs to be. But it is highly replicatable. What we've done here has been with a C student with bank debt financing. It's highly replicatable. It can be done over and over again. Every ecosystem is there and every economy is different. So you wouldn't emulate what we do exactly. But this sort of focus on restarting the cycles of nature which is my version of rewilding, is highly replicatable. The other thing I would, would challenge is, uh, I, agree with, I agree with what you said about feeding people, but the assertion seemed to be that land is the limiting factor. And I would suggest to you that land is a limiting factor, not the limiting factor. I'm not sure we won't run out of a lot of other, with industrial Commodity farming. We run out of a lot of other uh, resources before we run out of land. We we can run out of land. I, I admit it. We can also run out of water, pure water, good water. We can run out of these reductive fertilizers. I, we, we're in agreement with all that. But there's a there's a lot of things we will probably run out of before we run out of land. Do uh, do you have? Ellen, do you have that link of that broken water system that I think Jenny sent you? I, I, it doesn't need to be played now. At some point during this during this interaction, I want I want I, that that's kind of a mic drop moment. That and, and, and I got a question for Nicholas. This is a question. This is not part of my response. Nicholas, the 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 plant based diet that you advocate is it the, the sort of farming that that Jimmy advocates with? Farmers raising vegetables, small farmers individually raising vegetables for the local market, or is it big fields of peas and soy for plant-based protein? Because big fields of of soy and and uh, peas are going to look just like this industrial farming we've got going on right now with corn, cotton, peas. Okay, yeah. So good question. I first want to respond to what you mentioned before about uh, replicability and scalability, and then I'll answer that because that's a great question. So, uh, I mean, we have research on land. Of course, there's other metrics as well, other planetary boundaries that their food system is going to gonna affect. Uh, in almost every case, a shift to plant-based diets, even if it's a more industrial intensive plant-based diet, would still be better. And I can show evidence for for showing that. But just in terms of land, just to end on that point there, perhaps that'll come back in the conversation, but a uh, study out of uh, Harvard and Boston University, 2018, showed that if the U.S. wanted to match the current factory farm beef to grass-fed and not alter beef consumption, this is a key part, U.S. beef production would require 63 to 270% more land. And that's like a grass-finished system. That's not uh, the regenerative agriculture system, the like regenerative ranching that, uh, I mean, as your study showed, Jason would use two times more land than that. So I think land is a big part of this discussion. And um, to your other point, uh, I advocate as much as possible for uh, veganic agriculture. And I'm not naive that there isn't challenges to that. And uh, maybe we'll let Jimmy talk to that at some point in this conversation. But uh, I think the scalability of veganic farming is far, far easier and accomplishable than uh, regenerative agriculture as it's currently defined. So uh, I think there's a few ways you can do that. Uh, and some of it is very logical. Uh, we have a huge food waste issue globally. 
I think something like 30% of all food is, is wasted. Yeah, it's high, of course. So uh, with that food waste, there's ways to repurpose that. There's ways to integrate that with uh, vegetation, native vegetation that's growing and create some high quality compost, which could be used, of course, in veganic farming. I'm sure you use lots of uh, compost as well in your system, Will. So this is a way that we can scale this up in a way that is ideal. You know, to, like to the, the last point about your kind of commodity crops, let's not forget that 50% of all commodity crops right now are for confined animals. So I think we're in agreement that factory farming system needs to end, but I don't hear any regenerative ranchers saying we need a massive decrease in meat consumption. Cause if that was the case, I probably wouldn't be talking much about this stuff, but when that's not part of the conversation, and instead we're talking about kind of this like carbon negative beef or that we need to replicate this across the world. I call BS. Yeah. So just some thoughts. And I didn't know, Jimmy, did you want to follow up first? I know that he had asked you about some things on that. Yeah. I'm just going to say that I absolutely agree. Uh, <laughs> uh, a monoculture co uh, corn or soy field is about as biodiverse as a parking lot. So, you know, it's, it is the two biggest crops grown in the United States today by acreage is corn and soy, followed by wheat. And and like Nicholas said, the vast majority goes to animal agriculture or in corn's case, also to fuel or ethanol. So, And what's even more disturbing, I find really, really disturbing, is that we're exporting our land to Saudi Arabia, to China, to Europe, to South America, with selling these soy, the soy in this corn for them to raise animals. So because they can't grow those crops there because they're too dry, but they still have decided to confine and raise animals. So me, I find this probably the most shocking of it all, that in the United States and Canada, we are letting our farmlands be sold away, whereas we can be using this to feed. And somebody talked about food insecurity, it is a big problem in the United States and Canada. One out of eight families every single day may not get a nutritious meal every single day in the United States and Canada. So yes, it's complex, but it's also extremely real. And of course, it does follow poverty lines. In Arizona, I was in one of the poorest counties in the United States, Navajo County. Uh, and we were talking a 55 to 60% unemployment rate. The food insecurity there was astronomical. So that is a very real problem as well. So a um, few things, right? Um, Nick, the, and the challenges I have with a lot of the research you cited is that none of these papers, they, they never factor in what's happening with soil carbon. They haven't factored in the fact that we've lost over half our topsoil in these same cropping systems in the last, you know, since the Green Revolution, right? And, and so, number one, I think that if you look at the main influencer of a carbon footprint in any system, it's the amount of soil carbon that we've lost. It isn't methane, it isn't nitrous, it's soil carbon. And I think that it's, it's a, a bit of an easy out for the plant-based argument to say we need more of this when the land that he's actually regenerating that you're accusing him that takes twice the land is trying to repair what a, what a crop system that you're advocating started in the first place. And, and I just, I don't find that to be a, a plausible argument. Secondly, today's corn crop in the United States, only 35% of the corn crop in the U S actually go into livestock anymore. Of that, maybe half go into cattle. The number one areas now that we see two thirds of it, are going into corn syrup, they're going into corn oil, uh, and they're going into ethanol. And the distillers or the byproduct of that is actually built into that to, to that number. And and so things have changed. I mean, we can also look at, at intake data. I mean, you look at the last 200 years, saturated animal fat intake has decreased 70%. While in that same vein, we've seen a linear increase in calories from oils, from soybean and and, and so the fact is, is that we're eating considerably less animal fats today than we have for a very long period of time. Uh, we've seen very negative impacts on health since the 1980s. And, and I think just, you know, blindly pointing to animal fat or animals is that problem. 
Uh, we know it's processed food, right? We all agree we need to eat real food. But but the fact then is that, you know, on so many of the acres that, that we have today is that management doesn't get taken into any of this data or any of the meta analyses. And, and I think that there is a lot of complexity in that, that we just blanketly do meta analysis over the world. And, and the fact is, is that, you know, we, we've done a lot of work at Will's place and measuring it. And, you know, I, I'd like to, to, to understand why you, you want to debunk the work that he's done. And I mean, I don't necessarily appreciate the fact that you're putting out all this media and you never called me, right? Like I'd have been happy to talk to you about the work we did or the challenges we might have had. I mean, I'm sure we could probably get along. Um, but but I just like to know where you're coming from because there there seems to be some some areas in the arguments that that are leading us right into this negative eroded landscape that what he's trying to regenerate. Okay, I'm gonna let you reply, Nicholas, and then I want to move on to the next question. There's a number of things I want to reply to. First, uh, the the comment about processed foods. Generally, yes, I, I advocate for a whole food plant based diet. But to say all processed food is bad, I think that's a very blanket statement that lacks complexity. Uh, tofu technically is processed; it's an incredibly healthy, healthy yeah, food. Ultra processed, ultra processed. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're talking about ultra processed in this case. Now, I think there's a number of health arguments that could be made there, but I don't think any of us here are experts in that to make that. I think that's another conversation. Um, in terms of soil health. Uh, I guess first, I'll answer, where am I coming from? I'm coming from an appreciation of nature. I'm an ecologist. I I, I study uh, forests and ecosystems and wetlands, and I've, I've got years of experience with conservation organizations uh, across Canada uh, and climate science organizations across Canada, and nature-based solutions is a, is a big part of my work. So one of the biggest drivers of nature collapse is ranching. Now, I'm not... Like I'm in no way trying to like debunk Will Harris is firm. That's not that's not my approach. That's not my my style. I explore these ideas and I comment on them because I'm seeing evidence on it. I'm seeing peer reviewed scientific evidence. And when it comes to soil, you mentioned soil. Uh, Ratan Lal, one of the most respected soil scientists in the world, uh, shows that. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, he's got a number of studies, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that shows overall, of course, this is a blanket statement, but agricultural soils store 25 to 75% less soil organic carbon, right, than native untouched ecosystems. Even rewilded ecosystems will store more carbon. And we're not talking just in soil. We're talking also above soil, also trees that don't have that same soil carbon saturation. So, it, I could pose some questions back, but I'm sure there's other questions we get into, but I like to get into soil carbon saturation and how come it's not really reflected a whole lot in your studies. And I'm not asking this question in like a, uh, an attacking way. I'm generally curious why from your take that soil carbon saturation is not factored in because we've seen time and time again, there's, there's a number of studies that show eventually soil saturate, especially on agricultural land, it can be time limited and easily reversible. So I don't even hold a whole lot of weight in that soil argument that that's like a thing to necessarily lean on. But I'd be curious to know your thoughts. You bet. Yeah, so I, I work a lot with Francesca Catrufo, who is a world's lead. Uh, she's a collaborator. Uh, she and I are working on a, a $20 million grant throughout the United States on looking at the metrics of soil carbon. And the fact of the matter is, is that, I mean, to me, saturation is such a red herring in the debate. And primarily because the majority of the data, when you look at soil saturation, there's, there's basically the, the aspect of microbial, you know, associated, mineral associated organic matter that's microbially facilitated. And the fact is, is that it takes 10 to 12% organic matter in a majority of our soils before we see saturation in, in the mineral. And the fact of the matter is, is if you look at the soils that we see in grazing systems and agriculture, most of will soils that we've measured are in a, a three to five percent range. A majority of the cropland acres are at or below one percent. So the fact of the matter is, is we're not going to see saturation for decades upon decades upon decades. Um, and even then, we also know that there is a linear uh, growth of uh, you know, basically the palm or the particular organic matter. It's more labile, granted, 
it's uh, organic matter that we see more in forested environments. Uh, the final thing I'll also say in respect to that is often these uh, saturation debates are only happening in the topsoil. Uh, just only recently are we starting to go down a meter deep or even 1.2 meters in terms of measuring overall management impacts on soil carbon. And what we're learning is that even in the 50 centimeters down to 1.2 centimeters, there's a lot of things going on down there. Um, you might want to point, Nick, to the Rothenstead study, and the Rothenstead study does show saturation. But I'd also like to say it's that study was done on hectare plots, and in terms of their grazing, they didn't even graze livestock. They mow it, and they put out manure. So here we are doing soil saturation work where we're trying to mimic a grazing event, and we're using that to prop up global arguments in terms of saturation. And so the fact is, is that, yes, can we see saturation? Absolutely. But only in very, very high concentrations of soil organic matter. And in the systems we see today, we are so far away from that happening. I don't even think it needs to be part of the debate today. So you're talking like 20 to 30 years? No, further than that. Because the fact of the rate of organic matter, it's going to be considerably higher. Um, often, and, and, and I've even talked about it in, in some studies that we might expect it to happen in 20 to 30 years. And, and more than not, it's often just to, to, to make a statement that I put it into a paper, right, that, to, to, you know, talk about the reviewers. But the point is that um, I, I would love to send you the article Francesca put together in, in uh, I believe it's in Nature, on this. And the fact is, it's going to take a considerable amount of time. Man, I, I hope, man, look, I'll say this, Nick. If we could, if we could get 10 to 12 percent organic matter in our ag soils in 30 years, I'll retire and call it a career. Because that, that's the volume of, of soil carbon it would take to saturate. Okay. But are I would... you offsetting the methane? Okay. Excuse me? Are you, oh. are you, offset, are you offsetting the methane in this case? So if yeah. we're going to do this by grazing, are you going to offset the methane that's being emitted? Yeah. I mean, you look at, I mean, it's been happening for millions of years. Okay. Number one. And I think we've had ruminants on Earth since, what, 56 million years ago. And we've had methane cycling in those systems. But we have 4 billion now. Yeah, but, but if you look at the, the research, uh, let's look at North America. I mean, pre-colonial ruminants, there's more megafauna then than there is today. You look at the work in Africa, there's more megafauna there. Now, what I will grant is that they're in different places and they're managed differently. Um, but I think from a standpoint of looking at overall methane, our work has shown that time and time again, we can't offset methane. In fact, where I was working in Australia, uh, the Australian national government actually has emission baselines for all of their ranches and they're monetizing soil carbon under the auspice that ranchers must be able to offset the methane emission, uh, which is happening in, in, in several land bases in Australia today with government regulated monitoring. And so the fact is, is that can methane be a problem in ruminant systems? I will say absolutely yes. But I think simultaneously with management and what I've seen producers do throughout the world, it's something that can definitely be offset. And it's a natural biogenic cycle that's been happening for a very long period of time. Okay. Um, this is all super fascinating. And thanks for everything you're sharing. I want to move on to another question, though, um, just to break it down for those who are listening to this. Jason, or uh, yes, uh, Jason, can you please explain what is regenerative agriculture for both plant and animal farming? Yeah, right. Well, I think I, I, I always think of plants and animals in synchrony together, but regenerative agriculture to me is effectively the emphasis of soil health principles in agriculture uh, at work. And you know, talk about soil health principles, we talk about minimizing disruption. We talk about perennialization or keeping green plants growing and roots growing for as long as possible in the system, uh, adding uh, microbial uh, biodiversity into those systems, getting animals back into our, our grazing systems, um, et cetera. And the fact is, is that um, I don't believe regenerative ag is a qualitative metric. Either you are or you're not. I think that no matter where anybody is in agriculture, whether you're big scale ag or small ag, there is room to implement soil health principles that can help regenerate the ecology of those systems. And, and, and everybody's on a gradient of where they are in life. And, and I think that's the way that I try to approach it. So I'm not isolating a crop farmer or an animal farmer or a big farmer or a little farmer, but more than not, looking at the principles that lead to regenerative and ecological outcomes. Great. And uh, Nicholas, do you want to reply to that or Jimmy as well? And then I have another question so before we get into it too much. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, regenerative agriculture has largely not been defined very well. Uh, there's a there's a big variance in terms of what people think it is. Of course, it's one of those terms, right, that is replacing older terms. And, you know, typically, of course, involves improving soil health, increasing some biodiversity, um, you know, reducing erosion, integrating usually compost, uh, cover crops, no-till. But like, you know, I think regenerative agriculture should be more than that. It should be also what can free up land for native biodiversity, like in a significant way, not just a little bit more biodiversity in the soil, but uh, native animals back to where they should be from before. And I think that's entirely possible. And I think regenerative agriculture should uh, net sequester more methane than is emitted. And we can come back to that methane topic because I don't buy at all the evidence that there's farms all across the world that's offsetting their methane. Cattle ranches across the board are net emitting more methane than is being drawn down. And there's abundance of data showing that. Yeah. Do you want to reply to that? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I'd like to define regenerative agriculture for you. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was an, as a, as an industrial farmer, uh, my, every day I looked for technology to kill some perceived pest that was in my monocultural system. That was that was the the it, it actually defined a good industrial farmer is spot the pest whether it be microbial, animal, veg, vegetation, whatever, fungus, and, and and kill it. Use technology to kill it. Uh, fast forward to the last twenty years, I've been farming in a manner that I consider to be regenerative, and it, it is the opposite of the industrial system. I, my goal today is to create life, more life, more species, more diversity. Uh, I, the, the, the industrial model breaks the cycles of nature that I listed for you before. My goal today is to restart those cycles of nature. And again, Nicholas, I consider what I do to be a really good form of rewilding. Okay. Um, what about you, Jimmy? Is there something you want to say about what regenerative agriculture is? Yeah, from what I've seen, there's, and from what I've researched, so there's regenerative agriculture with, with uh, relation to animals alone or grazing with the idea that there are uh, plants being grown that the animals then graze on. Then there's regenerative agriculture, which is kind of, kind of an organic agriculture system where uh, we're trying to produce more biodiversity of plants within our cropping systems, but also uses a vast amount of, say, off-farm manures in, or, in an organic system. And then there's the system that I was lucky to jump upon, which is the veganic agriculture system. And what we're doing is we're everything completely comes full circle. So we'll grow the plant, we'll let the plant grow up, we'll harvest what we can. So let's just take broccoli, for example. We'll harvest the head of broccoli. The rest of the plant then decomposes back into the bed. So is there, there there's almost no, <laughs> all the carbon that we were taking out, which is the broccoli, we're then leaving the entire plant to sit back onto the bed. In addition to that, in our particular system, we underseed with, with cover crops. So we'll underseed with, say, clover. And this is something that bigger veganic agriculture models are doing. I just certified, a, I, I'm, I'm the co-founder of a certification, a new certification in North America called Certified Veganic. And I just certified a 400 acre soybean, rye, and, and popcorn farm. And now this is in that idea that, oh, that's that big monoculture. And I'm the same way. I'm like, whoa, that's too big. I don't want that. That's, that's crazy. But what he's doing in this particular farm is he's underseeding with cover crops while he's planting his soybeans, while he's planting his popcorn, while he's planting. So his soil organic matter has gone up in just three years from, say, 4.4% to 5.1% because it's a no-till system where he's just incorporating the cover crops just in a plant-based system, no animals at all. So a regenerative system, the conversation a regenerative is fine. But I believe that it really must be one that is 100% plant-based. And if we want to graze animals, because we feel like in certain areas this is possible, again, we can do that in a management facility, but we just don't kill them. We don't take them off the land. 
unfortunately, a White Oaks pasture. And and I have to say, Will, that your model, your grazing model is quite impressive. And I've read your, I've read it. And I used to be an animal raiser back in Arizona. I raised goats. I raised chickens for their eggs. I raised goats for their milk. So I get it. But 98.5% of the animals that you raise are broiler chickens that are eight to 10 weeks old and then killed. I don't understand how that works in the the grazing principle we're talking about. We're talking all this about beef, but yet 98.5% of the animals that are slaughtered on your farm every year are broiler chickens that only live eight to 10 weeks. And if they're anything like the organic chickens I saw, they can't even stand up anymore by the time they're being slaughtered because they are genetically bred to be so heavy that their little legs cannot support them anymore. And this is just undue suffering. It's just sad. Go ahead, Will. Why don't you reply to that, Will? I would suggest you look at, in terms of measuring volume, pounds, not number of head. Okay. Pounds of beef versus pounds of chicken, not number and of And I head. think it's what? It's 50%, 50% on your farm, right? Or 45% chicken? or no. uh, The inventory today would be uh, about 3,000 head of cattle. That's close. And probably... Uh, I got, I got I got less chickens than cows on this farm right now, so no. Uh, just just the white oak pasture study that you did, Jason. That when you you actually listed all the animals from the study that you put out, and ninety eight point five percent of the animals were broiler chickens. We have downsized it's, the poultry yeah. business dramatically and increased the okay. animal volume since that study. Okay. Yeah, I said okay. today. Yeah, it's changed dramatically, and um, okay. So that was an unsustainable system, is what you're saying. I didn't say that, but I made the business decision to to change the mix. Okay. Okay. All right. So I have a question then um, for Nicholas. And then uh, Will and Jason, you guys can reply if you'd like to. What's the state of regulation and accountability within the regenerative label? Okay, so for for me, in, in terms of the the state of regulation, it's um, there's very little. I mean, people can call their farm as regenerative uh, and, and market it that way, and this has caused you know a number of greenwashing greenwashing situations where consumers are not necessarily aware. Now, in the wider situation, like the food system as a whole, lacks a lot of transparency. We don't know where crops necessarily come from. We don't know where food comes from in the grocery store. This is an issue, of course. But when it comes to uh, kind of very strong, bold claims about carbon negative beef, regenerative uh, beef, there's not much regulation. And even if you look at like the farms that are plotted across North America on various maps, Regenerative International uh, has a map of firms. And uh, you can look at some of the maps that are plotted on that map, and they're actually intensive feedlots. So, uh, you know, that's just obviously deceiving to customers is deceiving to everyone. But then you can also like just input yourself on that farm and people have done this and um, you can call yourself regenerative, even though it's not even a functioning farm. So that's a major issue. And I think one thing that's worth mentioning that I think would be open to discussion for uh, you, Jason and Will would be, I still see what are pastures beef as marketed as carbon negative. Yet the study that you did, Jason, showed it wasn't. The original Qantas study, of course, showed it was. But then the updated study showed it was not um, sequestering more carbon in the ground than the methane that was emitted. So I kind of want to know, like, is it carbon negative beef or not? Yeah. Um, First of all, like, it's good to agree, Nick. I am so frustrated with the greenwashing on regenerative ag today. And I can tell you that it is a, it's a huge frustration to be working to try to promote better ecological principles in ag for the last 20 years and feel like you're getting a headway. And then you see that term co-opted in a lot of ways that um, to me is um, inexcusable. Um, I think that one way of working through that would be to have a, like a global standard for generative agriculture that would Really, the key I think that it has to be is it has to be outcome driven. And so often when we look at food labels, we're checking a box. Um, 
I, I believe in, in the, the premise of organic agriculture in many ways, Jimmy. I'd like to also say the, the very worst soils I've ever been on in my entire life were organic soils in California where they had greens and were growing lettuces after lettuces because they had to till it so much right, to keep the weeds down, right? And so the, the thing is we put these check-the-box uh, practices, but it, it doesn't yield the necessary ecological outcomes that – that we talk about, right? So the fact then is that I, I definitely agree with Nick that we need considerable emphasis on what is truly regenerative and transparent to a consumer. I get frustrated with the grass-fed labels that are not um, very specific. Um, there are opportunities that people can add grains to those without regulation. I get frustrated with the fact that we can bring product in from all over the world and run it through a USDA plant and then call it a product of the USA. Um, all those, Nick, you and I completely agree. Um, I'd also like to say, and again, if we could have talked, you know, a little bit about this, I understand the confusion on, on the work we did at White Oak. And the, the primary thing I'd like to say is that it, it all goes into the areas that we sampled over time. And, the, the way that um, some of the media was done as compared to how I decided to frame the paper were different, but it doesn't mean either were wrong. And the reason is, is that when we went through and did a chrono sequence on Will's Place, and again, I hope you understand how complex and challenging it is to take all these moving targets of land over time and try to piece together a story. I'll also admit the fact that when we do these hard systems trials, we can never be like 100% like please the soil scientists, the animal scientists, the crop scientists. Sometimes things get a little messy in, in how you work with them. But the, the premise, though, is that what we did is that we went in at a time zero and we found land that was extracted, that was completely beat up. We went to a time three, a time five, a time 15 and a time 20, I think, if, if memory serves. That time 20, and this is where, where the confusion is. Just a quick had, thing, sorry. You average that out, right? Um, the, the, all those samples, you average it out on the on the plot? The Yeah, yeah. I, I forget the amount of samples that were taken. We actually worked with Dr. Stephen Rosenweig, who is a, a CSU-trained soil scientist that works with General Mills, D does a great job. I mean, Steve's done a lot to, to work with General Mills' supply chain in terms of regenerative ag. And Steve did the work on this part. Um, but But... But the premise, though, is that the time, the last period in time when we, when we sampled had only been grazed by, by cattle. There was no end part of poultry. There was no pork. There had been no compost. Okay. And, was and there so, manure spread? Other, other than grazing, that's it. There was no compost, no nothing, right? And I, I, I believe I articulate that in the paper. And, and the fact is, is that from that time zero to that point, we saw 2.29 over that period of time sequestration. And so the fact of the matter is if you take the existing amount of cattle that Will's running and you don't take the impacts of pork or poultry and the main impacts they have on soil carbon is that they're adding nitrogen. There's also energy that we did account for energy that comes onto the farm in the form of grain um, that, that adds that nitrogen and that nitrogen, you know, Jimmy, as you see, you get more nitrogen in your, in your compost in your system, you get higher metabolism, you get, you know, things going faster, right? And so the fact is, is if you take his cow herd and you take the sequestration value at time 20, um, you, it, that, that amount of sequestration at his stocking rate will offset it. And that's what was promoted. Did, did I necessarily agree with the way that everything happened on the promotion of that? I got kind of mad, didn't I, on mm -hmm. some things? He, he would agree. I didn't, I didn't like the fact the way that some of that came out. It was out of Will's control as well. It was some, some corporate things that evolved. So the way that I did the paper was different, Nick. And, and the fact is, is I added the pork and poultry to make a whole system of it. And the fact is, is when you add pigs and chickens to that model, the entire farm in of itself, it's awful hard to knock out a footprint on a pig and a chicken, okay, from a carbon perspective. And, and so the fact of the matter is, is that I, I, I framed the paper in a different way, but it doesn't make the claim that Will made necessarily wrong either. And so it's just, I think, a, a point of confusion that's out there. If, yeah. I, if I was that way, I apologize, but I, I just want to say that. 
Oh. I appreciate that. Sorry, just one thing, Will. It, it does make that wrong, though, because it's not carbon negative beef. And if you're bringing in nutrients from off land, I know you accounted for it uh, in the study to an extent, but you're bringing in feed from off land, feeding it to the monogastrix, chicken and pigs, and then spreading that manure, right? It's accounted for. Everything was accounted for in the LCA. And it, and it can be definitely carbon neutral. What the fact is, is that if you take a 2.29 sequestration value, Okay. Now, now let me say this, you know, there's always extrapolation, right? And, and, and I do believe in real validated numbers, right? But the, but the fact is, is nothing is easy. But if you take the sites that have been grazed for 20 years without any other inputs, and you compare that to the land that started is a, is a denuded extracted cornfield. Okay. And you take that over time, that that would that that number I've done the math a lot, man, and it, and it will offset that footprint. There's no doubt it can. If that if that sequestration rate at the stocking rate that he has, it, it it happens. And I mean, we we worked six months to get that paper published. Six months through peer review. I've worked others and, and had challenges, of course. But I will also say that we're measuring sites today that are also building that kind of carbon as well. So I don't think it's just a one and done by any means at all. Yeah. I I'll, so I'm just going to say let, one quick thing. Okay, and then let's let uh, Will go. I, I, I would really like to see a lot more evidence that you're, you're net sequestering far more than the methane that's emitted because there's an abundance of evidence showing that even the best systems, at most, they're, they're offsetting part of it. They're not necessarily bringing it down. And <laughs> you also need to account for other things that are done on the farm that were great. Of course, you were planting some legumes, compost. Uh, there is nut-bearing trees. Like, these things all make it great you can't assign that all to the cattle yeah but the site that only had cattle <laughs> the point is like the sites that only had cattle that's the, the sequestration rate we reported on right so we're taking we're taking a site right and again this is a mosaic in time okay farms are complex man and all the guys that you cite i mean i i, I respect them but they're not in agriculture either many of them right they're they're modelers they're economists or these other they're, folks they're also not funded and, and, by and industry the, either right so that that would be a, a benefit to some extent wouldn't it like wouldn't that skew a bit results sometimes too when there's a lot of industry funding involved so you know let's go ad hominem there but i mean the fact of the matter is that i mean i've i've worked my career uh it, it to publish to to take uh, as impartial of a look as I can, and to make that ad hominem claim, like that I'm getting funded I'm by the industry. I'm not saying this is necessarily changing your ethical standards as a scientist. I'm, I'm definitely not saying that, but but I am saying that in response to to claiming that other agriculture people are not allowed to weigh in if they're if they're kind of an ecologist as a whole and they're scientists looking at this the space. I think they should be able to weigh in as well because I think they would have a bit less of a, a biased perspective on the alternatives, rewilding, freeing up land, things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's a naive claim you make. Uh, I think the fact of the matter is that if you look at the supporters of, of the, the Eat Lancet report, or you look at, at all the supporters that are looking at this research from a plant-based perspective, I think it's, it's damn naive to just talk about the animal guys being the ones funded by big industry. And the fact of the matter is that there's got to be private funding that comes into all of this. And I, I think the, the fact is, is that, you know, there's always challenges no matter what research you're looking at. Is it good to claim and to, to think about that? But but what I heard was kind of a blanket nuance that, oh, well, the big industry is funding this and I don't agree with it. Um, and, and so, you know, again, going back to that data, um, I, I feel that it is supportive. I mean, we work. Um, is it perfect? No, absolutely. But nothing is. I, I mean, I'll say that, man. It's, it's very hard. Um, but, but I think likewise to sit there and cherry pick studies, you know, based on a lot of these meta models, I mean, it's really hard to try to take demonstrated farms and real farms that often don't, they don't, the complexity doesn't capture them, man. And, and so I, I'll quit, but, but I didn't know if you wanted to say something or, or what, you know, but yeah, I, I do. So first of all, no livestock other than cattle were on this farm up to 2010. So all the progress in any Im impact that these other species have had have been since 2010. But that's not my point I want to make. That's just a fact. You know, I, I hear these 
scientists argue endlessly on the scientific method of measuring carbon. And, and I get that. Just because you're using reduction to science, both sides, no matter who it is, is using reduction to science, very linear, that, that was uh, developed for a laboratory situation where things can be very precisely managed. And I tell you, I have no idea how one starts to measure carbon. I have no idea. I'm pretty good at sequestering carbon. I have no idea how to measure it. But I'll tell you what I can do. You and I can go out into my pasture with a spade, a very non-scientific instrument, a spade, and we can turn it over. And I can show you that the soil looks like chocolate cake right beside industrially farmed land. It could have been growing soy and whatever else that you want to grow for further processed foods. And it looks like compared to conservation agriculture, though, like that's a false comparison. That's a false economy that doesn't have to be compared. Right. You don't compare quality grazing like what you're doing to industrial crops. That's that's a that's not a good comparison. Well, I I think I can because you keep comparing industrial cattle production to what I'm doing. So I think if you can do that, I can do that. I've said I've said it. Yeah, 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 you did. You did. I've said it's across the spectrum, the impacts. And I, I think I've actually done a good job in balancing that there's lots of good things happening on your farm. Uh, there's a huge spectrum to, to plant agriculture, just like there is for grazing. So, yeah, I, I don't think you can I don't think you can make the comparison. I, I've seen uh, you do a good job, Will, of describing how your model is better than neighbors and your model is better than industrial way of doing that. I think that's phenomenal how you're describing that and how you're showing the difference. Uh, I I just think that when you're comparing regenerative agriculture, animal versus plant, I think it should be a fair comparison. Okay. So what would be a fair comparison then, Nicholas? Yeah. I mean, you should be comparing to a, a conservation agriculture system. So it doesn't need to be necessarily full veganic, but you can look back at indigenous populations that have farmed only crops. They have not necessarily integrated domestic animals and this goes back a long, long time. This is not just a new system of farming. Veganic farming goes far back. And I think if you're making a comparison of, say, your farm, Will, with another farm, I don't think you should be comparing to industrial crop agriculture. One, because most of that's really just for confined animals, a, a big percent of them. And two, I, I just think that if we're going to be also looking at regenerative agriculture as a whole from the plant perspective, that's what you should be comparing to. Well, I'll certainly try to not do that. But you please try not to uh, mix my farming up with industrial farming. I definitely don't want to do that. I I don't, because your farming is different. Yeah, and I just want to say I agree that Will's system is nowhere near comparable to a conventional system. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. I get your regenerative agriculture system. Okay, so how do you think it does compare then? This is for both of you, all of you to reply. The regenerative ranching versus regenerative plant agriculture. Maybe Will and Jason can reply first. How do you think that compares? Do you think that plant regenerative plant agriculture um, fares better or equal? Or do you think uh, grazing and the true regenerative grazing the way that you're doing is better than regenerative plant agriculture? Or do we need both? Uh, yeah, like... I guess the way I look at it is um, I don't look at the output, right? And I, I've never really thought, honestly, until Ellen, you said it, I've never thought in terms of regenerative plant versus regenerative animal ag. I, I just think of the interaction, right? And, and the, the integration of this, that there are, you know, beautiful things a ruminant does, like upcycling considerable protein from inedible you know, human and edible um, plants, right? And, and it's something that's kind of a superpower, right? I think that, that we can take advantage of in cropping systems. Um, you know, the, the fact then is that I don't really, I, I guess I just don't choose to compare them because at the end of the day, right, I care about farmers. And the last thing I want to do is see like a circular, a circular, you know, firing squad between a plant farmer and an animal farmer and, and the fact is, is that, you know, what, what I would like to see is that the output uh, of, of what's being produced is, is not, the, not the, the, the point of discussion, it's the management of it. And no matter what we're doing, 
in the place that we are at, that we emphasize the best principles we can to do the best job of raising these things that we can. And, and I think that we, we're going to come out with a lot better solutions and, and outcomes uh, in terms of focusing on the management versus the actual output of that system. And I'd like to add to that, that Nicholas, I don't think you will find anywhere in anything I've ever written or said or put out in which I was critical of plant-based regenerative agriculture. N nothing, not a word. I've never been critical. But you have been very critical of my animal regenerative agriculture. Yep, that's fair. So again, you, you're, you're the aggressor here. All right, Nicholas, how do you have to reply to that? I think that's a fair point, but I, I'm standing up for nature because I know you're protecting nature to some extent within your farm, but there's no wild carnivores that can go through regenerative ranchings that are replicated across the world. There's not that native ecosystem that we can re return. You can do it to an extent, and you've you described that well, Will, but this is nothing at all personal. I've seen, uh, I've, I've read a lot about your story. I've read a lot about your farm. I think you've done a phenomenal job there, and I think you're very smart. I just think that what I'm discussing is an idea and an idea can be very, very invasive. And the idea that we can replicate regenerative ranching across the world, there'd be nothing worse for the, the ecosystem of wildlife that we need to restore for native ecosystems. We're talking wetlands, forests. You can't restore a full forest if you're doing regenerative ranching. Uh, currently, this was from a paper from uh, Tim Searchinger. Uh, 42% of current grasslands used as pasture land used to be forest or woody savannas. So you can return that, but you can't do that if you're going to be advocating for that. And like, I just want to ask, like, cause th this was a question I asked earlier, but there was not a response. And I think this would definitely put me back a bit in like, you, you, you kind of are, I'm coming off a bit attacking. I'm definitely not attempting to be, but if you're advocating for a significant reduction in animal source food production and consumption and what's left for grazing or the, the, the pasture land and the ranchers that, you know, will not switch, they'll always do that switch to your model. Are you advocating for a reduction in, in meat and dairy and animal source foods, or you think that we can meet the current demand and the increasing demand with this model? The, the, the answer is, is neither. I'm not advocating for reduction of of food uh, of meat consumption, nor am I saying it should it should be where it is or higher. I don't know where it should be. I'm saying that I want to use my land to its highest and best use in restarting the cycles of nature. In do and and someone else could choose to make the same choice with plant regenerative agriculture. That's fine. I, I support that. The amount of food we produce will be the maximum we can produce operating within the cycles of nature. The abundance is spun off and the cycles of nature are operating optimally. Now that food that's spun off will be made available to consumers. It may be that meat is too expensive for some people to eat. And I, you know, I, 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 I don't want to get into economic disparity. I can't solve that, yeah. but I want, uh, I won't be able to use to follow my path, which is using my animals to restart the cycles of nature, which again is my form of rewilding. I think it's a beautiful form of rewilding. I'm happy for Jimmy and the other vegetable farmers to use regenerative plant agriculture to produce food on their, the, the land that they, I won't say own, but have uh, exercise control over today. We'll all produce as much food as we can, and we'll offer it to consumers. And consumers will decide whether they're going to eat more or less meat, more or less vegetables. Now, I really worry about your uh, dogmatic clinging to eating only plants and how that might lead to ultra-processed plant-based protein that is farmed industrially. I don't know that you, you keep talking about how much meat can we produce farming with animal agriculture regeneratively, I don't know how much uh, food we can produce farming plant-based uh, crops, peas, soybeans, whatever, regenerative. I don't so, know. But I think... Yeah. So, I mean, I there's been studies on this. Uh, senior science writer for NASA, Emily Cassidy, and others showed that growing food exclusively for direct human consumption could increase available food calories by as much as 70% and feed additional 4 billion people 
more than the projected two to three billion people coming through population growth. So yeah, diet change is difficult. I, th we can talk about that topic too. Uh, I don't know that we're going to go that way. I'm not dogmatic that we need every single person to eat this way. I just think we should shift to more plant-based diets for the planet. And I'm curious in your case, Jason, like, are you calling for a reduction in meat or you think we can meet current demands through this model? Let me, before you answer, Jason, let me phrase the question that I have written down here, which is similar to what you're saying, Nicholas, but I think it helps the, co the conversation. So this is posed to you, Jason, but you guys can all reply. What would happen to the meat supply if the current demand for meat switched to grass-finished beef and regenerative agriculture-style farms like white oak pastures and we ended factory farming? Is there enough land in the U.S. or globally to support that? So go ahead. There's, Yeah, see, there's been multiple attempts to do it. Uh, there's been some back of the envelope calculations uh, that that show that if, if we were to go into the land that is under CRP today and, and improve the management, the, one of the key challenges that in our studies and what we've seen is that when we implement adaptive multi paddock grazing, we see a 30 to 40 percent increase in productivity on the same land, which is significant, right? Um and, and so then the fact is, is that if we were to implement that throughout the United States and elsewhere, where Nick appropriate, I think, um, there, there could be a, a huge um, improvement in the overall amount of protein that is produced that way currently. Um, and so from that perspective, there is a lot of opportunity to increase the amount of efficiency, productivity, on on grass-fed cattle um, often when we look at these studies they're just done in these very simplified continuous grazing systems that are low in terms of productivity and and so i i work with people that that would indicate that that they they do believe that we could keep the cattle numbers fairly the same and shift uh into um more of a grass-based system but, but I've never felt confident in those numbers. I've never felt really confident saying one way or the other, to be honest with you. Um, and there are some massive efficiencies that can be gained uh, by grain finishing. But, but the fact is, is again, what I'd also like to say is that, you know, most of the systems in agriculture today are using anywhere from 150 to 250 units of nitrogen per acre to grow, to grow plants, to grow grass. And what I'd like to say is that to me, when we talk about these numbers, we're also factoring in, we have that much fossil fuel coming in to any of these systems. And I think those are the things that we miss in these meta analyses is that what if we were to take all that out? Uh, Jimmy, you've done it, right? Yeah. What if you take all of that fossil fuel, whether it be a plant-based system or crops for agriculture, then things change dramatically, right? On what these outcomes look like. We don't factor that into any of these meta-analyses. Likewise, again, we don't factor in what's happening with soil carbon. Um, and, and I think those are important things that we should add. And, and so not to, 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 to go around it, the last thing I will say, Nick, is that quite easily the best grazing systems I've seen in terms of biodiversity, in terms of soil carbon and management, are, are done in, in, in woodland savanna environments. And, and I'm a big advocate in, in many of our areas that I think we need to get trees back back into as many of the pastures that we can. The thing that I thought about differently is that I'm working with people that have cattle, that have multi, multi-generations of ranches behind their, and I can't just say, we're gonna get rid of them and we're gonna rewild it. it. It really doesn't work that way. But what I can do is take some of the things that you're saying that I agree with, and what does it look like if we try to restore this into more of a, of a savanna? Or what are the ways that we can try to get more biodiversity into these systems? And, and so I don't disagree with, with what you're saying. I, I know Tim uh, as well. Um, I, and I, and I, am, I am very much for the fact that, that we do need to get these trees into our systems. And finally, and I'll hush, I feel like I'm talking too long. But we also can't have this conversation without looking at the massive amount of the Great Plains that was plowed up to go into corn for ethanol. And I mean, we're talking millions and millions of acres and millions and millions of tons of carbon that have been lost. Not to mention the grassland birds that are relying on ruminant migratory ecosystems. And so I, I want to say is that it isn't just cattle that we, that we have these troubles with, right? Um, I, and I think that it's important to understand that 
you know, you look at, at the Midwest where all the, all the grain, you know, we know that that Michigan was fortunate. It built Chicago, it built New York, hell, it built Chicago twice with, with our pine, right? And, and so the fact is, again, I, I, I don't think it's just a cattle situation. I think it's an agriculture yeah, problem. I, uh, I agree with a lot of that. I think biofuels are a terrible idea. I don't know why we are advocating for this in any way. I think it's, I think it's horrible. Um, I think it's also like important to be clear, even if we're not talking about a veganic model, we would use less fertilizers and pesticides if we shift to plant-based diets. And the reason why that is, is there's a major, major feed conversion loss when you're turning plants into meat. Most animals, you're talking about a, a 90% loss when you're trying to convert growing plants, converting it into meat. And this does not have as much to do with your model because we're talking a bit more of chickens and pigs. But like, I still don't know why we can't have commonality around a reduction in animal source foods. Of course, we should address all the other food system issues too. But I mean, okay, so let's get off the beef topic for a second. Let's talk about chicken and pigs. Surely we can agree we need to massively reduce the amount of chickens and pigs that are farmed. I agree. Yeah, I agree. think that that's super. I think that's super interesting, Nicholas, because. 90% of all animals raised in the United States are chickens. And so when we look at that, when we look at those planes where, and those are broiler chickens, those aren't even laying hens, those are broiler chickens. And when we look at those planes where it's just corn and soy, there's a reason why we grow that much soy. It's because it's the highest protein source per acre. It's the highest caloric source per acre. And so if you're eating chicken, you're basically eating soy. Uh, because that's what they're getting in their diet to make them so big so fast. Go ahead, Will. You know, for the, for the, for the record, I'm not arguing our monogastric program. I, I'm, I'm, un, I'm unsure where I want to go with that. And as I pulled out earlier, I've downsized it dramatically, and I'm really unsure. I, I benefit, my land benefits from the animal impact of some uh a uh, hog activity to, 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 to give some disruption to the land, the nitrogen from the chickens is some benefit. I am not arguing that animal agriculture right now. But Nick, again, you just convoluted my kind of, my kind of ruminant with, the, with the grain. My, I don't give grain to my ruminant. I don't do that. So that. Yeah, I'm not talking you know, to like, you necessarily, Will. Like, this is a question, I guess, more for Jason. Like, I, I just, I don't know why we can't find commonality on some aspects of this. Of if we're going to be shifting into these things, like even agroforestry like, that you mentioned, Jason. There's many, many benefits of it, of it of course. But I, I just don't understand biophysically with some basic biophysics, we cannot farm the same amount of chickens and pigs globally let alone the population that's going to increase meat consumption as they become richer. So we can't, we can't do that model. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple things, right? So like, I, I don't, again, I, I do local, I do more work. Right. Um, and you know, Nick, obviously you, you read a lot of papers and, and, and I, I see that's, that's kind of your role. So, you know, when I, when I look at these things and I look at opportunity costs, right. And, you know, the, the White and Hall paper and PNAS would, would suggest highly differently, right? Where they, they did their model and their model said if we go to a 100% plant-based diet in the United States that we only gain like 3% on emissions and, and we have micronutrient deficiencies, right? So that model's in PNAS, but of course you're not going to agree with it, right? And, and the fact is, is that everybody's got the model. And everybody can talk these numbers based on what behooves them. And you can have your science and I can have my science. And again, I, you know, do we need to eat less pork or poultry? I don't know. But what I do know is we can do a hell of a lot better job in how we farm and how we manage. Because what you can't convince me of is that how we're already farming the plants is going to be that big of, of an improvement. And, and again, we're also only talking about this on a caloric basis. I think when you start breaking this down into available crude protein, uh, when you start breaking this down into micronutrients and other deficiencies, you know, just weighing out food is probably not the best comparison. Um, you know, there's a recent, a recent LCA that just came out out of Rothamsted this last week that when you put protein on a DIASS basis, a digestible amino acid basis, you come up with a considerably different answer 
Then when you look at a caloric basis on the impacts of food and, and the amount of, of caloric, uh, you know, the, the, the differences in terms of the amount of digestible available protein on LC basis versus calories in of itself. And I, I don't think it's easy to take a pound of protein from animals and compare it to a pound of broccoli. But yet that's what the Springman paper does, right? And, and so I, I think there's always caveats and challenges to this that, that, that happen right there. Um, the Springman paper, their LCA is, it's on a weight basis. You look at their, the, the way that they balance out their food, right? And, and so, um, I mean, like, you know, so, so what, what should I say is, is what I'm trying to get to with the fact that, you know, why are we so convinced that if we, if we eat less pork or poultry, that we're going to just inherently understand we're going to farm in a better way. Because what are we going to do then? Are we going to replace all the soy with turnips? Or, like, I, I'm just trying to track how we're going to do that. And, and I just want to learn from what you're trying to trying to say. Okay, Jimmy, you were shaking your head. So why don't you reply to what you were going to say? And then I guess the question posed to Nicholas and Jimmy is, basically it sounds like you you both have concerns that if there was a shift towards more plant foods, people eating plant foods, unless animal foods, that we would just see more of this monocrop type of farming that you're seeing now for plants. That's your concern, it sounds like. So can you guys uh, speak to that? No, Go ahead, Jimmy, first, great, and then Nicholas. Yeah and, yeah, and it's a great, it's an excellent point. I mean, somebody said earlier that we need to change our agricultural system in the United States. Me, I'm a huge advocate for making our farms smaller. I really think that we lost this sort of family farm, mom and pop shop. I'm, I've am i owned two farms in my life. It's always been, first one was my first wife and I, second one, my second wife and I, and that's it. We don't have employees because we want to see what how much we can actually physically handle. And depending on your region, in Arizona, it was an acre, just farming plants. Now, I did have animals that I did raise, but here it's a half an acre. And on that half an acre, we produce a diversity of fruits, vegetables, and herbs, over 100 different varieties for sale for us to eat. And now it's not just turnips. We grow our own dry beans. We grow our own flax. We grow potatoes. We grow tomatoes. We grow all the things that you would need to store, can. Think of it back like when our great grandparents were around in the 1920s. They all used to have their farms. And they all used to put up their crops. And this was a mainstay. Nicholas even mentioned that there were indigenous cultures. And I used to live within miles from the Hopi culture. And the Hopi culture grew corn, beans, and squash. And this is what got them through the difficult times, right? And they didn't grow it with manures. There was no, there was no bison in the high mesas of northern Arizona when they were there. There were deer. There were mule deer. There were pronghorn antelope. They weren't using that manure for anything. And the way that they were trying to grow, and, and this is where they were getting their protein from and their calories from. So when you ask, like, do we shift to a monoculture system? No, absolutely not. We shift to a highly diverse. So I grow 100 different varieties for sale. We grow over 400 on our half acre, 400 different crops. And why is that important? Because we're trying to bring back the bees. We're trying to bring back the reptiles and amphibians. We're trying to bring back the birds because like Will has been saying in his model, and I don't know how many species of grasses you're grazing there, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 20, but when you're talking about 400 different varieties of plants that, that animals and birds and butterflies and insects want, now you're talking about biodiversity completely in action because we're bringing everything back and we're doing it in a way where we're not dominating any species at all. We don't spray. We don't, we don't spray when there's an insect pressure. We don't spray fungicide. Now, all of this, I think Jason said that the soil organic matter is really bad in organic systems, and it is. It's, it's awful because they constantly till. They replant lettuce on lettuce, and we see that in these small micro farms. All of that needs to be changed. I am talking about a systemic change also. I think that the model can be the more diversity that we can produce on the smallest amount of space and let the rewilding happen, however that we need to do that. Here, I couldn't graze cattle to get my rewilding effort. Here, I just need to let it just do what it's going to do. And what we've seen is in the, just the nine years that we've been here, now we've got birch forests again. We have mushrooms growing underneath the birch forests again. We have 
low canopy crops. We're going to have maple trees growing up above them and pine trees and, and fir trees that are all reproducing itself without me touching anything, just letting it go. So rewilding can happen depending. Now, it is sure that if a farm has been farmed since 1866 or however long your family has owned the farm will, it might take that long for it to come back. Because if, it, if the farm was owned in 1866 and the damage was occurring, not, none of this is your fault. I'm just saying that if industrial agriculture was happening and happening and happening for 100 years, it might take 100 more for it to just get back to its pre-Columbian level. All right, Nicholas, you reply, and then I have another question to move on to. I don't have a whole lot to reply. I mean, shifting to plant-based diets would use less cropland, in including less arable land as well. And when you're when you're taking crops, feeding it directly to people, you don't have that feed conversion loss. Where if you're taking crops, especially in the case of chickens and pigs, I'm talking here still, and you're feeding it to them, you're getting a major feed conversion loss, upwards of ninety percent. And chickens are seen as like obviously the most efficient way of getting meat. It's still at 88%. You get about 12 calories back if you give them 100. So, um, yeah, in terms of like the issues with industrial plant agriculture, I also don't like them. But you get far less shifting to plant-based diets, even if you're not shifting to Jimmy's model. And I think that's a very important thing to understand. This is this is the biophysics, biophysics of what we're doing to grow crops. If you If you instead feed them to people directly, you'd get more food. And, and you would use less of the land, water, crops, um, cropland, and, and so on. So I, I, I just think that I, I still can't quite understand why we can't see that the factory farm model that is pumping out billions and billions of animals, I don't understand why we can't acknowledge that that needs to be reduced. Because if we're, if we're against industrial agriculture, um, which I, I appreciate your your major advocate will to say we need to get off this model. I, I don't understand why we can't admit that confining billions of animals, feeding them crops is an efficient system that we should extrapolate across the world. Nick, again, that's not what we do. We're in agreement on the industrial farm model. We're in uh, industrial uh, animal agriculture. We're in agreement. Don't don't confide that with what I do. You're doing that again. That's not what I do. No, I'm not saying that's what you do. I'm saying as a food system overall. I'm saying as a food system overall, why can't we understand that confining billions of animals, feeding them crops, and getting a major feed conversion loss is inefficient, and we should be looking at reducing? You can say reducing a little bit. I mean, I think we should reduce it significantly for the reasons I've, I've showed. But I, I just don't – I'm not necessarily speaking to you, Will, but I don't understand, Jason, why we can't say we need to reduce it a bit. Yeah, I – you know, like I said, I, I don't think of it in that term. You know, I, I think about it and how we farm. I think about the pragmatic nature of what our food system looks like and how I can make the best changes. Um, so, okay, I'm, we're going to reduce pork and poultry by 20%. How, how does that work? Does, do we, do we have our government call, call the, the, the food system? Do we have our politicians mandate it? Do we do like what's happening in the Netherlands and put dairy cows off the land? And, and so, so again, like what I'm trying to say is that just because I, I make a statement, we're going to reduce pork and poultry. Um, then what, what happens? Like I, I'd like to know again what the, what is the pragmatic approach? So to me, it becomes across like almost imperialistic. That we're just going to come in and we're going to tell you farmers what to do. And we're going to tell you all these these entities what, what they're going to do because we want to rewild. And I just don't understand how any of that works. And, and so it doesn't make sense for me to sit there and have this debate on we, we need to reduce this or that um, under this notion that, you know, it's, it's going to we're just going to snap our fingers and all this is going to go away and all our you know, we're going to, we're going to be on this diet and I, I just don't understand it. And, and so I, I see a, a food system today in the United States that represents 9% of the U.S. Uh, US EPA says U.S. agriculture today is 9% of our total emissions, 9%. And I, I see a system that produces a lot of food. Absolutely. Does it have problems? Yes. But just with that premise alone, I'm trying to track how all this works. 
right? Like I, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, so, think, okay, so, so I, I think this is kind of a, a good topic to cover. Uh, this is obviously more the policy area. Uh, I am in no way advocating for any sort of mandate, any sort of imperialist system. But let's think about, okay, how did the world meat consumption quadruple since 1961? Okay, so these, these are stats that you can track. It's quadrupled. And that's poultry primarily. I mean, no, there has been a major increase in, in ruminants as well. There's been a decrease a little bit lately in beef consumption. You're seeing a bit of a plateau happening yeah. in certain countries, which is great. New Zealand, Canada, Switzerland, they're plateauing in terms of their beef consumption and increasing a bit of chicken. So that's not so good. But I mean, this is the result of of lobbying, of subsidies, of marketing, of funded academics, governments bailing out the major, major corporations like Tyson, Cargill, JBS. This stuff just doesn't happen with free will. This is this is what happens with propping up these major, major corporations. And I think that line of reasoning you're saying of like, hey, well, what do we do here? I'm not just going to tell people to stop, uh, you know, affirming that, or I'm not going to mandate them to stop doing that. I mean, I agree, but like, what are we going to do with oil and gas? And like, this is obviously out of our realm, but like, how are we going to get off oil and gas? How are we going to get off coal? There's ways to do it. There's ways to do it in a just transition. There's ways to do it by making the alternative more accessible. In that case, it's, you know, energy systems. It's, I think it's even a bit more complex than food systems. But when it comes to food, like plant-based foods are far from accessible. Healthy plant-based foods are very expensive. They should not be. The, the, the cost associated with producing most animal source foods, and again, Will, don't take this as, a, as at you, because I'm not necessarily talking about you, but the, the cost of producing animal source foods does not have all the impacts internalized into it. So how do we create change? We do these policy shifts. We make it more accessible to make a better choice. We shift subsidies from harmful to better, and the list goes on. But this is policy change, and these are things that need to happen. You keep saying this ain't about you. It was a reference to me. I'm the only animal ag guy in this room. I'm the only guy here that owns it. It, it, it is a, it, when you, you should have Purdue and Tyson and Smithfield on this debate if you want to attack the industrial system, which is what you keep. Well, I'd love for you to, and don't bother me. You know, I didn't, I didn't come up with this idea. Yeah. But you or, or Ellen or somebody did. Mm -hmm. You invited me to be on. To argue for industrial animal agriculture, which I is my enemy. I'm opposed to that. Yeah. You keep doing these little sound bites where we say, "Why can't we just agree?" Well, I, you know, it's a, you're putting on sound bites here. That's what yeah. you're doing, and I know that. Mm -hmm. So let's 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 talk about if I'm going to be in this debate, let's talk about me and my system, yeah. and quit yeah. going back to the other system, which you're perpetually doing. <laughs> and that's why I feel like I'm being personally attacked by you. Could I just say one thing, Nick? So let's say we go plant-based. So what you'll have happen is you're going to have Tyson, JBS, Purdue, and National, everybody, guess what? They're all going to have their plant-based product. Okay. And, and so the point is they're, they're already investing in them, right? They, they are. Um, and, and so the point is that, like, it, it that system will still win. Right. If, if that if it's a win and loss, that system will still continue. OK. And, and they're not going away. Right. And, and so I don't I don't see again where you look at, at that. Um, I think the, the challenge of industrialization, the challenges that we see with the unintended consequences, which I agree with you on, um, are all going to be there still. OK. Um, I do want to move on a little bit to another question that I want to ask Nicholas and then I want to hear uh Will and Jason reply. Before I do that, I think um, it is really important, like you said, Will, to preface that you're not advocating for the standard industrial animal farming. I think what Nicholas is trying to maybe say is to see if you guys have common ground. It sounds like you're both against that. And so that's really, really helpful for everybody listening to know that that's not what you both advocate for. Nicholas, I think, is trying to come from a place to see if you guys can agree that even if there was more animal agriculture shifted towards your way of farming, that it's not sustainable to keep up the amount of meat habits that our current um, America has. And so he wanted to see if you guys can agree with that, that if we were going to shift the majority of our meat systems to do it the way that 
will you advocate for and that you do that we would need to reduce the amount of meat intake that we eat. It sounds like that that's where there seems to be some miscommunication if you guys agree or disagree on that. Um, I don't know if you guys want to speak on reply to that for a second before I move on or if you think that that's pretty good. Uh, this is exactly okay. the main thing that I'm going at because if we're going to replicate the, the, world, the, the white oak pastures model across the world, we need a major reduction in animal source foods. And then we can have that conversation. But that's not happening anywhere. There is some, of course, there is some policy people that are advocating in that way, but it's far, far less than it should be. And I think if we're, if we're looking at the signs around land use um, and other metrics as well, then you're going to have uh, issues replicating that across the world. And that's why I'm doing that. That's why I'm making that comparison. Okay. All right. Does that sound good there before I move on? Okay. All right. So the next question I want to frame to Nicholas, sorry, I'm losing my voice, um, is buying local food a way to reduce your environmental footprint? Please reply, Nicholas, and then Jason or Will, you're welcome to reply. I mean, this is a very common claim. Uh, being in the environmental space for the last uh, over a decade, this is the most kind of, uh, uh, you know, go-to thing that we should do within food. We should just buy local, no matter what it is. And I think that kind of steers away from the overall impacts you see with the overall food system. Uh, you know, 80% of the, the, the footprint from the environmental footprint as a whole is from land use. So like deforestation, ecosystem degradation, and, and farming. So the emissions from animals, farming equipment, fertilizers, you know, less than 10% overall is from transportation. In the case of beef, it's 1%. So of course, there's many reasons to support local. You know where the food is, you know the farmer, it's better for the economy, better to uh, support the community. But in terms of just, you know, the overall environmental picture, buying local is not necessarily the first thing we should be doing. I think we should shifting more towards plant-based diets. Go ahead. Yep. So uh, I agree that just because it's local does not mean it's good. Okay. You know, Spam and Pepsi and Cheetos are local somewhere. But I hope you will agree with me that centralized, industrialized agriculture absolutely has impoverished rural America. The money doesn't stay here anymore. The money goes to Wall Street or Silicon Valley or, or wherever else. The money does not stay here. It, industrial centralized agriculture has rendered rural America to be economically irrelevant. Nobody needs it. And if you think that's a good thing, then that's, that's fine. I don't no, think that's I, a good I thing. agree with you there. And I'd say that that expands beyond the United States as well. The, 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 the rural situation is an issue. And I think there's an opportunity to, to have it rewilding there. And, and there, like, there's no incentive for people that own several acres of land rurally to keep a forest, to keep the native ecosystem that was there. There's more money for them to cut that down, sell it, and start ranching. And I think that's an issue. You know, I, I, I am a rancher. I didn't quite get through. Uh, I, you know, I am a rancher. I'm a vertically integrated rancher. And I employ 180 people. And we write payroll checks in this building every Friday for over $100,000 in Clay County, Georgia. And if you look it up, you'll see it's one of the poorest counties in the United States of America. But that wasn't where I was going. That's true. That's not where I was going. And, and I will say that this has gone from a ghost town to a very nice little destination. And if you don't believe it, come and look. But that, again, uh, that, that wasn't my point. I want to talk about the resilience of the food supply. So the big companies that it sounds like you advocate for have, uh, for, for uh, it, just, I mean, it sounds like it, but, uh, have for, for so many years, the only metric that was important was efficiency and lowering cost of goods. Lowering cost of goods, efficiency. Incredibly vertical system that is very fragile. And we've seen the fragility in the pandemic. We've seen it in uh, storms. We've seen it in economic situations. These small local food systems offer so much resilience as compared to the I'm not saying that it's not incumbent upon me to be efficient. It is. It is. I'm going to be as efficient as I can. But efficiency is not the only metric I measure. 
Yeah, I think that's super interesting because me, I've also spent pretty much my entire life in rural areas, both in uh, uh, Apache County, not Navajo, that was the neighboring county, Apache County, Arizona, and now I'm in uh, the Utaway County or Papino here in uh, Wallo, where we have maybe 400 people living in our town and we're in the middle of a food desert, uh, as we were in Arizona as well. So if it wasn't for small farms, going to farmer's market, having farm kiosks, whatever, then there would be no such thing as fresh produce. Well, of course, is a food desert. They don't even define a food desert in Canada unless you're in a city. If you're in a rural area, they say, okay, well, if you're within 10 kilometers, well, our closest place to find good food is about 30 kilometers away, 17, 18 miles. So... <laughs> This is this is too much for we have a big senior population here. So I completely agree that what we need to do is bring back those local farms. And I I I am very impressed with the amount of people and what you've done in Clay County. I I just think that's impressive. Um because to be able to employ 180 people in a really really small town uh and everybody has food on their table and it's become a nice destination space. I think that's great. I think that's great. I think what Nicholas said is super interesting. I think that we can make our farms in places like this. Now, I have an interesting situation with a biologist the other day where he told me that we need to keep killing deer. Now, I'm not a hunter and I don't believe in hunting, but we need to keep killing deer because they're eating the forest because we killed all the wolves that used to eat the deer. And if we don't kill the deer, then they're going to eat the forest. However, interesting point. However, we let regenerative agriculture, this is what these people are calling themselves, run pigs in those same forests without, without any, without any uh, reason other than just because they want to start raising pigs for meat. But they want to kill the deer but raise the pigs in the exact same forest. I think, I think we have a problem when we're talking about regenerative agriculture and its definition. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So I... You know, Nick, it occurred to me we were talking, I, 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 you know, something hit me. And I, I think at the end, we both want to make improvements in land and in people. And it, it kind of just, you know, hit me that we're coming at it, you know, maybe in, in a good place, but from different ways. And I, I guess where I've, I've spent my career is that I work with farmers and I'm on the ground as much as I can. We've, we've got a new big project. We're working with 60 different sites throughout the U.S. And I care about rural America and I care about people. And I know you do too. And the, 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 the challenges I've seen, like where our site is in, in rural Michigan, 80 to 90 percent of that area in rural Michigan, the kids are on a school lunch program. And I think we can all speak to the quality of food that is probably in that system. And I've seen this massive extraction of rural wealth and well-being in my career. Today, the farmer gets 11 cents of the food dollar at the farm gate in the United States. And the, the lens I've come at that, you know, is when I go and, and talk to a farmer, Jimmy, about regenerative ag or, you know, hey, thinking about implementing these soil health principles, I often get a blank look. And it would be no different if I were to go into downtown wherever and find a, a young, impoverished person and say, you know what, if you invest in the stock market, you're going to be a lot better off. And they look at me like I'm crazy, like they have no concept of what I'm talking about. And that's the same problem and the same challenge I, I get in rural America today. Because the, the land managers and the people I work with every day are hand them out. They can have land. They can have machinery. Uh, they can have equity in that, but they still have massive cash flow issues. They're dependent upon the banks. They're dependent upon these challenges. And the way I've tried to work with that is to help them from a standpoint of getting more ecological resilience, thinking about how to, to, to make their lands better and more profitable. We haven't talked about profit hardly at all today. And that lens is how I've come through, right? It's like, can we do a better job with what we have and where we are? And that's just the way I've chosen to do these things. I don't like to get in these big global debates on what this looks like. I just care about my community and where I'm at. I've seen Will 
started when I first met Willie at 30 employees and now he's over a hundred, you said a hundred and 80. And, and that shows the multiplier effects of a food system that we don't capture an environmental footprint that we don't capture in a carbon footprint. And, and so at the end of the day, I, I think I can, I can acknowledge like many of the challenges Nick said today with biodiversity, with, with the fact that we have degraded land for agriculture. Um, and, and the fact is, is that for me, instead of having these big like thought experiments on what to eat and how to do this throughout the world, it's just starting at a local basis and working with people and seeing if we can create change and create concentric circles outside of that change to make a bigger impact for the ecology of the system. And so what I, I will say, Nick, is I don't disagree with many of the things that you're saying. It's just I've chosen to come at it in a way that I see more tangible improvements in my small career and window on the land with the people I work with. Great. Okay, Nicholas, go ahead and reply, and then I have a perfect question for you, Nicholas, to what they have to say. Go ahead, Nicholas. I don't have a whole lot to reply to that. I think that's a, a good way of putting it. We are looking at it from different lenses. Uh, I think we have lots of commonalities. I think that uh, we can look at it from both the – global scientific analysis and the local level and the socioeconomic challenges. And also on the back end, we can look at the impacts of not addressing biodiversity, not addressing climate change to the level we should, and what would happen socioeconomically in that way. So I think we can look at it both. I don't think we, we need to focus on it. And that's not saying that it's not valid to focus on it just the local level, because it can be very helpful to many. I just think we need to have both lenses. Great. So I have a question specifically for you, Nicholas. You advocate for a significant reduction in animal foods in the population's diets to help the environment. But is it unrealistic to expect people to reduce their meat and dairy intake that much? And can the white oak pastures model be good enough because it does improve the environment on many levels like soil regeneration? So how come that can't be good enough to basically what they're saying? Because you're, you're seeing things on a micro on your own level getting in the dirt and then you're advocating for instead for like a big meat reduction. How come what they're doing isn't good enough? Yeah, I, I, in terms of like him not doing enough, I don't think uh, that's an issue. I think Will has done a ton. Uh, my my issue overall is that we can do many things to shift towards further plant based diets. Integration of maybe seventy percent of diets plant based culturally relevant across the world. There's been a, a number of analyses to make that relevant no matter where you are in the world. E. Lance has done a ton of that analysis. And in terms of like the, the financial analysis of, of different organizations working on that, it is a, a fraction, a tiny fraction of the subsidies and financial institution grants going towards a shift towards plant-based diet as it is towards an overall animal source diet or to the big companies. So I don't think that's a fair comparison. Um, yeah. So in terms of like, how do we feed the world? This is what we need to be thinking of. Uh, if, if we're looking at replicating this across the world, then we need to think, okay, this is great. Is this going to allow rewilding? Is this going to allow wild ecosystems to return? Is this going to allow us to protect 30% of land by 2030? And uh, with the land analysis alone, but also some other ones as well, that will not do that. Okay, great. Um, I just have a few more questions I want to ask. And I want to bring the topic just a little bit more clear about methane. So if you could talk, Jason or Will, on your thoughts about um, the issues within that, within the regenerative model. And then I want to bring it next after that to the other other factors like um, biodiversity and soil health and um, animal waste even and water use. So let's go there just real quick. We, we've we been measuring uh, enteric methane, real validated data, not models, uh, for 12 years. Uh, we, we do that through different scientific methods. Um, I can tell you that any way that you measure enteric methane is a challenge, and that there's always challenges with respect to uh, meeting voluntary feed intake, uh, with the with the scientific, you know, you're running animals through a chute or, you know, doing things like that. 
Um, and, and what I can tell you on the, the small level is that when we generally use IPCC tier two equations in our system where I'm at, they often can overshoot um, methane by 15 to 20%. Often that's because of the digestibility of the forage. Maybe if I, sh I should start, you know, methane is a byproduct of forage digestion in the rumen. Uh, basically, it, it's, it's a way of binding free hydrogens in the rumen. It is 98% is eructated, 2% goes out the back end. Uh, the methane is in the environment for normally about 10 to 12 years. It is hydroxylated by OHs into CO2 and, and, and water. Um, methane has been fairly constant, we think, uh, for a very long period of time. We've had ruminants on Earth for 56 million years. Um, the methane numbers began to go up based on the, the science I've read uh, in the Industrial Revolution. Um, during that time, uh, we've not seen, in the U.S. numbers, we've not seen increases at all in the amount of ruminants that we have, but we've seen considerably higher emissions of enteric methane, pardon me, of methane, not enteric, of methane atmospherically. Often, um, what that would probably lead to would be the, the other industries that are bringing non-biogenic sources of methane into the atmosphere, i.e. fossil fuels. And, and so effectively then what has happened, um, if you look at the data from the last 10 years, example for EPA, uh, we've seen decreases in enteric methane from cattle in the United States uh, based on those numbers. And, and so effectively then, um, I mean, we can go in, I, I don't know how much you want to go into it, um, but, but what I would like to say is that methane is, this, this system has been happening for a very long period of time without significant changes in ruminant animals globally. And, and the fact then is that there are other sources that are leading to considerably greater amounts of methane that are now in the atmosphere today. Again, it's part of a natural cycle that's been happening a very long time. Yeah, so I think we can go back and forth on this a little bit. I think there's some good discussion we can have here. So um, yeah, I, I've studied methane extensively too. Uh, methane as a whole, uh, as a as a broad topic, it's resulted in anywhere from a quarter to even a half of, of warming to date. And of course, there's other sources of methane besides enteric fermentation, uh, oil and gas, natural gas in particular is a, a major source. Globally, the number one source of human caused me uh, methane is livestock. It is cattle. Now you can say that it's been like cattle herd numbers have been somewhat steady for a period of time. Uh, but if you go back far enough, you can see a massive hockey stick uh, uh, curve up of ruminant, farm ruminant numbers that have also contributed significantly to methane and to warming. Now, throwing the other way around, if we reduce herd numbers, we can significantly reduce methane quickly. And really all methane. We should be addressing all methane quickly. And the reason is because if we reduce all CO2 today, which we need to do a ASAP. We need to decarbonize our energy system. But if if we don't address methane, we're not going to address the, the short-term opportunities to lower our, our climate change impacts, to lower atmospheric warming. And by doing that, we can hopefully avoid some of the climate feedback loops we're going to face. Now, in terms of like biogenic methane, uh, I'm, I'm going to challenge that a bit back and uh, perhaps we can have a discussion on it. I've seen many of the, the brightest climate scientists in the world describe that methane is methane no matter the source. And I've pulled tons and tons of IPCC reports and have direct quotes. I don't buy at all that methane from cattle is perfectly a part of the carbon cycle. I think this is Misinformation by some is disinformation. It's directly to support a certain cause. Definitely not saying that in your case, Jason. But I think that it's it's flawed. And I'm going to tell you why. I'll talk about a little bit about the studies that show this. So when you talk about methane going up in the atmosphere from cattle, uh, it doesn't just convert into to CO2 and then get sequestered back in the grass. Only 1% to 2% of it breaks down into CO2. The rest, as long as methane is, is rising globally, heats the planet at about 80 times over 20 years. So if you reduce that quickly, you're going to see a major reduction. And, you know, this is there's direct quotes from IPCC describing this. So a small fraction of CH4 emissions is oxidized in the atmosphere 
to CO2 and H2O before deposition with the fraction depending on the location and timing of emissions. So to say it's perfectly a part of the carbon cycle and the biogenic methane doesn't matter, I don't buy that at all and neither does the IPCC reports. And they've, of course, they've categorized it a bit differently recently in terms of fossil methane and biogenic methane. But you can look at those figures and they're a couple different. We're talking 80 uh, or 79 for, for methane from biogenic sources and 82 from fossil sources. So they're factoring in this within that. So the narrative that methane from, from cows doesn't matter, I don't buy. And then if you're talking about like the historic situation of, of bison and how there was a lot of them, this is a whole different story. This is you're comparing wild native animals to domesticated animals, major ecological differences, which I think we've already talked about at the start of this conversation. But even in terms of methane, there's a lot of uncertainty. A lot of these ruminants in the past too, they emitted far less methane. And there's also research that shows they did have an impact on warming. But of course, pre-industrialization, we had a buffer. We could have some. And we would never want to take away native ruminants from a wild ecosystem because they net provide way more benefits when they're natively in the right place. So. Okay. Let's, let's wrap that up so I can let them respond. I'll leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're just going to disagree on the the way to analyze these numbers, Nick, and the fact that, you know, again, if, if you just, you know, you threw the 60% number out there, and again, I mean, you look at in the United States, only about 3% of the United States footprint is methane, okay, and and it, from enteric animals, right, and, and the fact then is that, you know, this has been happening forever, and and um, we only have seen these rises in methane since the Industrial Revolution. And we know that there was considerably greater megafauna there. Okay. And, and so the fact then is that also the IPCC does define biogenic and it does define enteric methane as part of a biogenic as a cycle that is not contributing additional CO2 into the environment. It's, it is in a I circular I way. I, where it does says it that say that? I would like to see that because I, I've, I've sourced, I've, I've it, I'm defining what biogenic, what is biogenic methane? What is biogenic? Of course, biogenic is more than just cattle. Biogenic is also natural sources too. But but it's in a circular way, right? Not and, and the fact no, not necessarily. That, biogenic does not mean it's a circular way. Bio, biogenic means it's, yeah. it's not coming from deep underground from fossil, fossil sources, right? But that doesn't mean that the methane doesn't impact the atmosphere. Yeah, it is an additional source. So, so the fact then is that to me, like, if you have this system, um, it's been happening a very long time, right? And, and so, you know, to to throw out like the fact that, you know, the uh, TNC comes out with a report just recently indicating they think that we're overestimating uh, the global warming potential of methane fourfold. Um, I We're working on a data set that's in review right now that would suggest tenfold uh, based on the half-life of methane and based on its global warming potentials. And the fact then is that these are all models, again, right? We're taking data that's hard to measure, and then we're trying to expound it into these large debates. Um, but when the TNC publishes papers like that, I, I, I tend to think that that's a pretty non-biased source. And, and so we can agree to disagree in, in terms of that. Um, what I will say is that we can always do better as grazing managers to lower that footprint through our management. Um, I'm not as a big believer in all the technologies that are discussed. Um, but I, and I also finally say is that when we do think about uh, methane in a shorter half life, what what also becomes a problem is that there is considerably greater methane coming off manure in, in feed yards and dairies and, and other confined situations. And because of that short term nature of it, it becomes a much greater problem. And if you have looked at the national data over time, we've seen uh, manure methane go up significantly while enteric methane is actually based on EPA data has come down. So we can't have our cake and eat it too. And the fact is, is that there are considerable problems that we're seeing with, with methane coming off manure. And, and that's something that has to definitely be addressed. Okay. Should I move on to the next question or Nicholas, do you want to reply to that? Yeah, I'll just say quickly regarding EPA, there's a number of situations where EPA is saying that methane is an urgent situation. We need to reduce it. Any sort of you know, conversation around the low greenhouse gas figures of a national scale, I think there's so much nuance missing from that conversation. If you're just talking about direct greenhouse gases 
uh, in, an, in a country that emits a huge amount, then that's going to skew the numbers a little bit. If you're not factoring how much carbon you can draw down from the atmosphere in terms of land opportunity costs, then that skews that number different too. And if you're measuring methane over 100 years, where you could instead measure it over a 20-year period, like it's happening in New York right now, then you're also going to get a far different number. But I mean, perhaps that's a longer conversation, but in terms of like low national greenhouse gas figures for different industries, there's a, a ton of nuance there. Agreed. I, I think one of the big challenges I've been frustrated with is like the fertilizer industry. And the fact is, is there's been considerably greater methane coming out of those systems based on drone reports and other things. That's what's actually being reported. Um, so what I will say, though, is that I, I do believe we can do a better job in managing methane in, in our production systems. Um, I, I don't believe that the the bovine, the, the grazing bovine is as causal of a factor of the the atmospheric numbers that we're discussing. All right. So agree to disagree. It sounds like with this. Um, can you then, Jason and Will, speak now on the soil health? You spoke a little bit about that, how regenerative animal farming improves the soil. How does it do in regards to biodiversity, animal waste, uh, water use, erosion, yield, et cetera? We, we've done chronology on Will's place from a standpoint of soil microbial health. And if you look at starting from, again, an extracted acre of cropland, and follow it through the system, you see exponential improvement in indicators like water extracted, organic carbon and nitrogen. Um, you see considerably greater active carbon. Uh, you see improvements in organic matter. Um, that can happen in a quote unquote regenerative plant system. It can, it can happen uh, generally speaking. Um, you know, the, the infiltration that, that we typically see in these systems as you build more organic matter, you build more pore space, you build more soil aggregate. There's more areas for water to infiltrate, and that keeps the system more resilient. We can do that in any system agriculturally. It doesn't, again, it's a principle of soil health. It isn't a practice that can only be done in, in a certain system. Um, you know, as far as, you know, the areas, if you want to take it in a, in a, in, in a, um, a standpoint of what we've seen and measured, I mean, all those indicators have gone up significantly from a standpoint of improvement. Yeah, let me talk on that too, Ellen. That so we're talking about plant plant based agriculture now, and that's what I've seen too. I took a piece of land where the old owner scraped the top twelve inches of topsoil, sold it off to make the road to the house. Now, I didn't realize this when I bought the place. Oh, I, no. I had no oh, idea. That's so, a bad deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was awful. So when I started, I was pretty I was pretty excited sticking my hand in the soil and realizing how far down it went. It was really sandy loam, kind of spongy, almost peaty. We're up here in a glacial, a glacial uh, drift off. And so we kind of we have that peat in our soil as well. But the acid level was 5.1. I couldn't grow a, a, a harvestable vegetable crop to save my life. And when I put a cover crop in, like buckwheat, it didn't even grow. Like it, it, it just stayed there. So I also had to find ways to bring it in. Now, I was not going to, because I was newly vegan in 2014, I wasn't going to bring in animal byproducts. I wasn't going to bring in manure. I just was going to try and do it with just regenerative plant-based products. And what we could get around here was straw and chip branchwood. And I don't know if you know of chip branchwood, this was actually developed in Quebec uh, at, the university, at the University of Laval. And they were trying to figure out a way to use sort of like the byproduct of the forestry industry. And what they were coming up with were these like really small branches that they couldn't log into lumber or turn into whatever other kind of wood product. And so they chipped it and they realized that the carbon to nitrogen ratio of this particular chip branch wood was like 70 to 75 to one, whereas wood chips are 115 to 120 to one. So it's super green. It was already, it was, and it was very fungal in its aspects as opposed to a bacterial kind of system, right? So what they did is for about 18 months, they would let this all decompose. And, and in a matter of 18 months, it would turn into a carbon to nitrogen ratio of like 16 to one or 20 to one. And it was just. Oh, you're rock star then. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. 
Exactly. So we thought about that and we said, okay, so we're going to bring in some of that ship branch because here around here, they have to cut around the power lines all the time, right? Otherwise, when we have the big wind storms and the rain storms, it's just going to fall on the power lines and everybody's going to be in trouble. So they call them kind of tree surgeons, right? And so they would go ahead and ship all this and we would just get it delivered here for basically nothing. And we would mix that with green grass from our strips in our fields. So when we would create our half acre, which was a down sloping system as opposed to a terrace system, because here we have so much water during the rain, during the planting season that in a terrace system, really the beds would just float. So in our permanent bed system, we kind of let it shift, go downhill. But instead of letting it go all the way downhill to the, to the creek that was below, so we would lose all our nutrients, we would create green strips in between all the, all the rows of beds. So they would just collect. If any compost would come off, it would collect. Any dirt that would come off would collect in those green strips. And it would just flourish, like the grass would just go crazy. So I would go and cut it back a little bit, mix that in with the chip branch wood, and that would create our compost. And because that grass is basically 25 to one mixed with that chip branch wood is 75 to one, well, there you go. You got your almost perfect compost ratio of 40 to one's best. I think we, we were at like 47 to one, right? So this is what we use to build our beds. Completely regenerative, happens all the time. Trees grow all the time. Grass grows all the time. We even incorporated chipped leaves or, or shredded leaves because they're here all the time also. We leave a nice layer all over the place and we decide to mix that in too so it wouldn't compact. Well, from that 2016 soil test, we had a soil... The soil organic matter was still pretty good because of that peat. It was 5.2. The pH was 5.1. We weren't going to be able to grow much. Seven years later, we're at 7.2 soil organic matter, and our pH is 6.9. So obviously, everything now just grows. Now, this is completely plant-based, just using regenerative materials, everything coming within 15 to 20 miles. Originally, I did buy compost because we didn't have the... We didn't have the knowledge yet of the people who we could get all the materials from. So I bought a what they call a live mulch compost, which was basically the same thing. It was a little bit further away, and we used that. But since 2021, we haven't been we haven't bought anything more in. Now, because of a kind of a catastrophic event that happened last year, we lost one of our fields completely because there was so much rain at such a period of time that it stayed saturated from May until November. And it just kept raining and raining. I mean, we must have had, I don't know, 300, 300, 350 millimeters of rain. So I don't even know how many inches that is. 20, 24 inches of rain um, in just the growing season. So we lost an, an entire field. We just couldn't even plant it. It was impossible. So I was like, well, wait a minute. What if I do a test? Now, if I'm getting, if I'm getting that grass, but I want more grass, I want more hay. What if I seed alfalfa with all the native flora that's coming back, all the yarrow, all the dandelion, all the, um, all the clover, all the red clover, all the white clover that's growing in there? What if I seed alfalfa too in that? Well, when nothing really else would grow, even the native flora, because it was too wet, the alfalfa proliferated, right? So the alfalfa grew really tall. And now at the end of the season, it sort of dry, dry, dried out a little bit. Now you have this native flora mix of like 15, 16, 17 plants. So now we cut, we're going to cut that and we're going to make our compost. So now I'm trying to understand and research because we're a research farm as well, trying to understand how much land we actually need within a plant-based system to create the compost that we need to fertilize our beds because we are obviously needing that compost to grow those veggies. And I'm pretty sure we're going to come to a ratio of one to one. One, say one acre of land is necessary to, be, to act as compost ingredients for one acre of veggies. So a one to one ratio. Um, I'm going to pose this question to Nicholas, and then I have one question for you, Jason. Um, Nicholas, you seem quite negative on your social media about Alan Savory and the Savory Institute. What makes you an expert in this area? Have you been on holistically managed ranches? Have you been to Mr. Savory's demonstration site, or have you researched them? Can you just kind of explain a little bit about that? Then I have one question for you, Jason and Will, and then we'll finish up. I've had since I was young a major distaste for disinformation and exaggerated claims. And there's nothing personal against Alan Savory here, 
but I have used him as an example because he's not just a one-off figure. He, he is really the leader of holistic grazing, of, of regenerative agriculture. He's been studying this for a long, long time, of course, and, and really is the go-to person. So um, I think it's totally fair to critique the ideas that he's putting forward. So I have not drank the Alan Savory Kool-Aid. I think there's a number of reasons why there's issues with this. I mean, you can look at countless, countless meta-analyses of the claims that he's made. And I don't think they're claims that any of us here would necessarily make, that you can reverse climate change with grazing, that you can reverse desertification. There's just not nearly enough evidence to back that up. And in fact, the evidence is pointing the opposite way. And uh, I mean, if you're looking at a meta-analysis on, say, biodiversity, this is also a big part too, 109 independent studies showed that removing grazing from land across all animals, livestock exclusion, increased abundance and diversity. And a big part of the topic with, with savory is, you know, arid landscapes and, you know, virtually desertified areas. So to reverse this desertification. But similar comparisons have looked at this comparison and shows that ecosystems with extremes in low temperature or high temperature can particularly be impacted by grazing, which can further damage soil characteristics, reducing already limited plant biomass and decreasing animal diversity. So the claims being made that have been very popularized by his TED Talk um, have just been in many ways exaggerations. Now, I'm not saying that everything that he's done is bad. Of course, there's been some good parts. But I think when you're looking at not only the, the meta-analyses on the topic and what they say, but also, you can even look a bit to his history to see that there's a number of challenging things that should make you be skeptical of him as a as leader to your movement. Um, his background is uh, a, a white nationalist military leader, and there's been countless issues of that. Some of these things he's admitted to, to being wrong on. Killing 40,000 elephants, thinking that would save the environment, he's admitted to being wrong in that case. Um, but then to go to the other extreme and say grazing is going to cure all the problems, I just think those types of ex exaggerations lack nuance, lack, lack complexity, have the ability to uh, lead to greenwashing, lead to people championing you as a, as a way to promote business interests. And I, don't, I think that's a, just a major trickery. And, uh, you know, nothing against him personally. I've had discussions with him back and forth. Uh, I open, I welcome more discussions because every time I talk to people that have different opinions than me, I always learn something. I welcome that. I might be wrong in some of these things, but I think that making exaggerated claims like grazing can reverse desertification, climate change, and cure the planet, not enough evidence, not even close enough evidence to back that up. Okay, go ahead, uh, Jason, reply, and then I have a question for you. Yeah. So, Nick, have you ever been on any of these ranches? I don't think I need to be on one of the ranch to have an independent analysis and compare the scientific analysis that's happening across the world on this. Have you been, have you been on an oil and gas rig? Are you allowed hold to speak an oil and gas rig? Yeah. Hold on. Let's let Jason reply. Yeah, true. go ahead. Yeah. The answer is none of the people writing these papers have either. Think... And, and the fact is that, is that when you get on these sites, okay, and you see the differences in terms of management. And I, I think if Alan got anything wrong was he was talking about grazing. And I agree. I think that's a wrong claim to make. But, but what I would like to say is that the nuance of land management that Alan has brought to the table in terms of bringing in the understanding of, of working with managers on managing the ecosystem processes across complexity um, Alan was was walking barefoot in the bush, you know, in the 1940s. OK, and and the most observant person. Now, do I agree with a lot of the things out there, Nick? No. But what I'd also like to say is that when you are out there and you see the differences in terms of management between people that are holistically managing versus those that are not the, the contrast is is immense. And I, I can tell you, I've, I've been on sites that they have worked with, the Savory Institute has worked with in Africa that had many, many challenges. One of which was the, the, the Wayne G people group, which is outside of Victoria Falls. And they fought desertification in their landscapes because they were overgrazing. 
And the key isn't the grazing, it's the management of the grazing. And I'll never forget the fact is there's a river, uh, the Sazenda River, that runs right parallel to their landscape. And they had been practicing this way now for like 10 years. And that river normally dries up pretty rapidly into the dry season. And to talk to the women there, the women are the ones gathering firewood. They're the ones walking to get water every day up to five miles. And as they began to improve their management and, and allowing for appropriate recovery in savanna grasslands, those lands began to regenerate. The water began to infiltrate versus run off. And that river began to become more perennial over time. And the fact is, is we can read all the meta-analyses they want, but when you look into the eyes of a woman from Africa that doesn't have to walk five miles to get water anymore because their lands are improving based on management, that means something. And so the fact is we can make the claims we want to make, but I think a lot of this, again, leads to being on the land, working with people from a social dynamic, and understanding how management changes landscapes. Okay, just really short reply, Nicholas, because I want to last the last question to Jason. Can I, can I respond yeah, to that? Go ahead. <clears throat> so, Nick, I think you have done an incredible job reading and memorizing an enormous quantity of, of research work. I don't think you've ever regenerated much degraded land. I think it's an act of incredible arrogance for you to decide this study's good, this one's not, this one suits me, this one doesn't. And then I think it's a, a, an act of incredible privilege for you to decide how people who've been on the land all their life should manage that land and how, what the people should eat that are buying the production from. It. So I'm, I'm blown away by that arrogance and privilege. I mean, I just want to have some some peer-reviewed scientific evidence of these anecdotal claims that are made. I don't think that's uh, coming from a place of privilege. I don't think that's coming from a place of elitism. In fact, I think there's an abundance of research money going towards justifying animal source foods in a number of different ways. So I've challenged Alan Savory on this. Peer review published that. He claims that's reductionist science. I think anecdotal claims about what you see on the land can be just as reductionist, if not more. So, and I also think that back to the claim about improving low income uh, women who also are working the land, there's many ways we can do that. And that's a very complex topic. And to claim that grazing is a, is a solution there, I think there's a lot of complexity missing from that statement. And I think that's used in a way to pull at the heartstrings to justify this this business that is destroying ecosystems across the world. So you can say that I'm coming at this from an, uh, a level of arrogance, certainly not my intention. Um, I understand that independent scientific analysis is important. I think we all agree on that. I think it's important to not cherry pick. I've compiled what I, what I think is likely the largest database on different reasons to shift to plant-based diets. This is not cherry picking data. This is a massive, massive library of the reasons why we should do that. It's not just environment. If it was just environment, we'd probably be looking at like maybe like a 90% a plant-based diet. But if you look at health, you look at pandemic risk, you look at antibiotic resistance, then this picture makes it very clear that we should be shifting towards plant-based diets. Okay, so I just have one final question for you, Jason, and then you guys can make your closing statements if that sounds good. Um, Jason, you have uh, mentioned Alan Savory as a leader in this space in previous like podcasts and stuff. So do you support, it sounds like maybe you don't, but do you support his claim that holistic grazing can reverse climate change where he stated holistic grazing would lower greenhouse gas concentrations to pre-industrial levels in a matter of decades? This was in the Savory 2013 report. Do you agree with that claim? I think that managing holistically can reverse the wrongs that we're dealing with today. And I think that that's perhaps different from just using grazing. Grazing is a tool in a toolbox. But I think that managing holistically, and what I mean by that is trying to account for the ecological, the, um, the ecological, uh, the economical, and the social dynamics of, of our world in the short and long term simultaneously can indeed rectify those challenges. Alan has brought considerable thought into that debate. Um, he got that from many other people, you know, that, that have been been through from, you know, uh, 
you know, Smuts to Voisson, uh, Aristotle, and others. Okay, so so I think that you know these these concepts. When we went from Aristotle to Descartes, I think we had a lot of problems, and I think that that what happens in these scientific debates is it's so difficult to account for that complexity. And, and that, that's what I'd like to say. And, and the fact is that um, there, there is a lot of, of positives that I've seen brought to land management globally. Um, and people I am honored to work shoulder to shoulder with that I've, I've seen that, 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 that confirm that. Okay, so to final uh, close this out, if you could spend just like 30 seconds, not too long on like a final statement, if there's anything else you want to say to finish off this conversation. Will, why don't you go first and then Jason and then I'll have Jimmy and Nicholas go. Yeah, I, I'd like to say that I am in closing. I am certainly not in opposition to regenerative plant-based agriculture. I think it's wonderful. Uh, I am not an advocate of centralized, industrialized, commodity farming on the animal side or the plant side. I'm in opposition to it. And I want to say that I, I am a uh, steady practitioner of this form of agriculture. And for me at this time, this place, this ecosystem, this economy, this works well for my family, for my employees, for my community, for my animals, and my land. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to practice. Great. Thank you. Great. Go ahead, Jason. Um, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if we've moved the needle in, in any regard, but Nick, uh, Jimmy, good to meet you and to hear your, your thoughts. And, um, you know, just closing every day, I try to be humble. And I've been working on land for a majority of my career. And every day, the, the longer I live and the longer I do, I feel like the less I know. And that's in a way just to honor the complexity of land and people and livelihoods. And my argument, I guess, or my, my, my premise is that I think that the tangible in front of me that I can help make a shift on the landscape through improved management, regardless of the system every day, uh, empowers, you know, my want to and my spirit to try to improve the livelihoods of people. And I am um, thankful for that opportunity to, to, to be able to work and to do these things. I want to give honor to the other opinions. Um, I have many dear friends that are vegetarian that I, I publish with, I work with. I love them dearly. Um, and, and so, you know, I just uh, want to give thanks for the opportunity and um, enjoy it. Great. Thank you so much. Nicholas, why don't you go ahead? Um, yeah, I think uh, I've learned some in this discussion that have been very helpful. I think uh, we have a lot of commonalities. I think if we focus on that in the regenerative agriculture movement, it would be great. I don't like the polarization of things. I think there is opportunities to uh, have regenerative plant agriculture just as much as a part of that conversation. The reasons I think I've made clear, I think we need to give far more land back to nature. And I think we need to give far more land back to native wildlife and native plants. And I ultimately don't see how that's possible with scaling up ranching. And I also don't see how that's possible without calling for a reduction of animal source foods. So uh, I also stay humble. I could be wrong in some of these things. I, I appreciate that there's lots of complexity to this. I think uh, none of these decisions should be made from an ivory tower. I think we should have independent scientific analysis from the local level and at the global level, looking at what happens when you make changes. Ultimately, I, I think we can agree. I think we should have far more access to healthy plant foods at uh, good prices, uh, because that's gonna be good for the planet, good for ourselves. And there's no reason people should not have access to healthy foods. So I think doing that, I think there's a commonality there. And I think if we work towards that within our other things we're working on, I think that would be a big win. Okay, can you make your final statement, Jimmy? I guess I have to say that everything that I've seen in my years of also having my hand in the earth and the soil, and I'm also a naturalist, so I want to see uh, the whole world come back before you humans dominated this planet. And, and I do respect 
the way that you manage things down there, Will, I do. Um, and if all ranchers ranch like you do, we might be having a whole different world by now, but I'm just afraid that that's not going to happen. People aren't going to listen to you all the time as they're not going to listen to me all the time, but I can push for a completely plant-based agriculture future. I can help transition those farmers away from an animal agriculture future so that they do stay on the land. I believe we need more farmers, but I don't see it from an animal exploitation and animal suffering issue. I, I can only see it now from a way of growing plants by using plants. And for that, I think we're going to be able to benefit our planet and for all beings that we share it with. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate the humility it takes to come on and have this conversation. And we're going to end it here. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Great. Great.